Hey, what's the story? I'm Ireland's biggest Peggle fan and son of a milkman, Sean Johnson. So in between my busy schedule of watching RuPaul's Drag Race and, uh, staring at the wall, I wanted to use my time during the quarantine to do something productive, so I decided I would make a YouTube video. I don't know why that's considered productive, but, eh, it's something. Anything is good at this stage. So I had an idea for a video that I was mulling over for a little while now. The concept is fairly simple, it would be to look at a group of games on a specific console, uh, review all of them and then rank them all from worst to best. It's not that exciting a video idea, the whole gimmick of it really is that it's, it's very long. It's a long video. Love long videos, so I do. Now you may be thinking, since this is my first video, I'd probably offer something nice and easy, something straightforward. A nice, easy going, fun, happy go lucky video. But that's not all we have today. Oh no. I instead opted for something that was a little bit more nostalgic for me, which is Disney PS1 games. I hadn't really played most of the Disney library for the PS1, so I thought it'd be fun to check them out and compare them and see which ones are good and which ones are bad. So I did some research and found out how many Disney games there were on the PS1. Now I know what you're thinking, only a gobshite would play 35 Disney games back to back in a row. But don't worry, I am that gobshite. Now before we get started, I would like to go over just a few quick disclaimers. Now see all the truth, the power of editing, as soon as I snap my fingers there, the disclaimers is gonna pop up. Alright, so first off, just a few quick disclaimers. We did use an emulator to capture all game footage, so if you see any sort of weird visual errors, please be aware, that's uh, probably the reason why. For consistency, if there is a North American release of a game, that will be the version I'm playing. If there's no North American release, I'll be playing the European PAL release. And if there's no PAL release, I'll be playing the Japanese release in that order. So NA, then EU, and then Asia. In the interest of both time and my sanity, I set a max time limit for playing each game, which is three hours. That being said, some games I played anywhere from half an hour up until the maximum three hours. And while I did not finish every game, I did finish quite a few of them and always at least felt like I played enough to give the game a fair shake. Keep in mind these aren't meant to be long deep dives into each game. If you're looking for an in-depth review, I guarantee you there's somebody on YouTube with a cartoon avatar who's already done it. But I will try to cover as much as possible in my reviews. And of course, this is all just somebody's opinion on the internet. We're all just here to have fun at the end of the day, so don't take it too seriously. And lastly, I appreciate this is a very long video that's kind of by design, but obviously not everybody has the time for this kind of thing. So to make it easier, every single review and the overall worst to best ranking is timestamped below. So if you want to skip ahead to a specific part of the video, go ahead. I don't blame you. So with that out of the way, here is every single Disney PS1 game reviewed in order of release back to back. I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. So starting off our list we have Mickey's Wild Adventure which was developed by Traveller's Tales who are mostly known for developing the very popular LEGO series of games nowadays. The first Disney game ever released on Sony's console was actually an enhanced port of a game from the previous generation. First released as Mickey Mania, the game launched for 16-bit consoles in 1994 and at the time this was one of the most visually impressive platformers on the market. Mickey Mania featured a bunch of cool technical tricks which gave some of the objects and areas a convincing 3D look and the sprite work was some of the best of the era. The characters and the animations also do real justice to the source material and it just really adds to the game overall. Now, not long after launch, Mickey Mania was ported to Sega's Mega CD slash Sega CD add-on, which added an enhanced CD soundtrack, additional voice dialogue, and an extra stage on top of it. And then two years after that, the game saw its final release, but again with a few changes. Mickey's Wild Adventure was released in 1996 on the Sony PlayStation. I don't know why they changed the name from Mickey Mania, but look, that's just how the game industry is sometimes, we just gotta go along with it. 
And along with the weird name change, uh, this PlayStation version only ever seen the light of day in PAL regions. So Wild Adventure is a further enhanced version of the already enhanced Mega CD version. So an enhanced, enhanced port basically. This game kept the CD audio, but also features entirely redrawn background and character sprites to take advantage of the PlayStation's hardware, which really does kick the visuals up an extra notch. So enough about ports, how actually is the game? Well, Mickey's Wild Adventure is your standard 2D platformer. This game's gimmick is that you're playing through a bunch of classic Mickey Mouse shorts. Take for example the first stage, which is set in the Steamboat Willie animation. You start out and everything is in black and white. Uh, the goat from the animated short makes an appearance. You come across another Mickey, who's the Mickey from the cartoon. Uh, this cat is here, and you can be a jerk to it, just like Mickey was in the actual cartoon. These parrots appear as enemies, and you can even fight a tobacco spitting Pete, who you have to knock out and then use his belly as a trampoline to progress through the level. And as you go on, colour gradually gets added to the foreground and background, which is a really nice touch. It's it's a great opening stage, and it really does set the tone that this game is a loving tribute to classic Mickey Mouse animation. Every level is based on a different animated short, so it really does kind of help keep the game fresh, and it's a fun journey through Disney history as well. I'm sure there's a lot of great easter eggs and things to look out for if you're a fan of the source material for each level. I haven't seen a lot of these, so I, you know, it doesn't really affect me in the same way, but if you're into this sort of stuff, it's, it's pretty cool to see here. I mean, gameplay-wise, it's fine. It, it was pretty basic in 1994 and in 1996 even more so. Uh, you can jump on enemies to damage them or collect marbles, which can be used as a projectile against enemies also. Thankfully, marbles are pretty abundant throughout the game, so you've always got an option of using a ranged approach uh, to situations, which would probably be wise because this game can actually be pretty difficult at times. The main issue is that the game really likes to throw a whole bunch of projectiles at you at once. Normal enemies like these skeletons just explode into bones, which you have to dodge. The environment loves spitting out projectiles at you. Bosses love doing this as well. The goal here really is just to be patient and assume everything in the game is out to kill you and if you're careful, you should be fine. But outside of the standard platforming section, the game likes to mix things up with these gimmicky sections as well and most of these areas have had updated graphics exclusive to the PS1 version. Although while these look pretty cool on the 16-bit era with some fancy effects, the 3D here is noticeably very early PS1 3D so I wouldn't say it's necessarily aged the best but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. The soundtrack for this game is also really nostalgic for me. It's not exactly wall-to-wall -wall bangers or anything, but it does fit the game really well. And the music for the Steamboat Willie level especially, like, this plays in my head 24 hours a day. Ever since I played this game as a kid, it's been stuck here. Hiya, Mr. Hope. It's, it's never leaving. All in all, I think it's a great Mickey Mouse game. I mean, I would say there's better 2D Mickey side-scrollers out there for sure. And yes, it looks pretty dated for a PS1 game. But the simplicity of 2D platformers often mean that these kinds of games usually hold up a lot better than most of the early 3D games on the PlayStation. And even now in 2020, this game is still a lot of fun. The PlayStation version is also probably the best version of the game available as long as you don't mind the odd load time here or there. You know, I actually really enjoyed my time revisiting Mickey's Wild Adventure and would definitely recommend checking this one out if you like the look of it. Next up is Disney's Hercules action game which was developed by Eurocom Software and released in June 1997. 
The name of this game is really weird. Uh, where I'm from, it's called Disney's Action Game featuring Hercules, and in North America, it is called Disney's Hercules Action Game. I don't know why it's not just called Hercules, but ugh, that's just the way games be sometimes. First off, I love Hercules. It's one of my favorite Disney movies by far. The gospel-inspired soundtrack is amazing. Danny DeVito is amazing. I just love this movie. But how is it as a game? Well, first off, from here on out, I'm just going to call the game Hercules because, let's be fair, the actual name of this game is really fucking dumb. So, Hercules is another 2D platformer, but as its original name implied, with a heavier focus on action. So, you'll be running, you'll be jumping, but now there's also slashing, punching, uppercutting, stomping, uh, zapping your enemies. There's also a fireball sword, whatever this thing is. The big death donut plasma yoke. I don't know. This game also mixes things up with these sections where you run towards the screen, which are kind of like the running sections from Mickey's Wild Adventure, but in reverse. These parts are fine if a little tricky to control. The section in the city with the Cyclops especially is pretty brutal with how much crap it gets you to dodge. And this leads me to my main issue with this game. It just doesn't feel that great to control Hercules. The character feels very sluggish. Like everything he does takes a while to get going. The jumps feel floaty and slow, sword slashes and punches have a small bit of delay. I generally like my platformers to be quick and snappy. Player control of the character is the one thing that you really want to get right in a game like this and Herc unfortunately just doesn't meet the mark in this regard. You throw this in with some cheap enemies, like these birds. I hate these damn birds. Also there's this guy who you can't hurt, and this flaming cat. Just get used to getting hit often in this game. Thankfully, it's not difficult to get around, you will take damage a lot, but there are plenty of health pickups to regain your life. And you can even extend your life bar by collecting these Hercules action figures, which thankfully are also pretty plentiful. Otherwise, it's a pretty good movie tie-in. It nails the aesthetic, the boss fights can be pretty fun, and the soundtracks keep the gospel vibe the movie is known for, although it does definitely feel like a low-budget cover version of the actual Hercules soundtrack. Uh, there's even some short clips from the movie included, a trend I'm sure we'll see more of as we go on throughout this video, but it's impressive to see here in 1997, seeing as it's the first Disney game on the PlayStation to do so. It's clear a lot of effort did go into making this game, and it does stand above your average licensed movie game, but unfortunately the sluggish player movement and a few other issues hold it back from greatness. To be honest, I do have a soft spot for this game, and I still find there is a lot to enjoy in spite of its many flaws. Worth checking out if you're a fan of the movie, for sure. Next up we have A Bug's Life, released in 1998 and developed by Traveller's Tales, the same studio responsible for Mickey's Wild Adventure. Now this is actually the first fully 3D Disney game on the PS1, and it's also the first Pixar game as well, so we have a couple of firsts here. So how does our first 3D game fare on the system? Well, pretty good actually. A Bug's Life is a 3D platformer with a few interesting ideas that help set it apart from other 3D platformers at the time. You play as Flick, everybody's favourite clumsy ant boy going on a big adventure to save his colony from the grasshoppers. Now Flick's moveset is pretty basic for a 3D platformer, you can jump, perform a ground slam, but what you'll mostly be doing in this game is just chucking berries at every little thing you see. You see you have infinite berries and personally I find it pretty satisfying to just spam these out all the time since there's no really setback for doing so. Where the game gets interesting though is with its plant mechanic. Dotted around the level, you'll come across these seeds either planted in the ground or free to pick up and move where you please. 
using these seeds you can jump on them to activate a number of different plants that can give you benefits like bouncing you to higher locations creating platforms giving you extra health super jumps improving the strength of your berries and a bunch more there's actually a lot of variety with them you can freely choose which type of plant you want to activate and you can upgrade the plants by finding these seed tokens dotted around the map the way the game uses this mechanic to encourage exploration around the map is actually really cool and it sets up some pretty tough challenges throughout the game. Honestly, it's pretty clever and I can't recall any other games using a system like this. Some levels are maze-like, others require you to solve a number of environmental and platforming puzzles in a single open area to reach the goal, and the bosses usually have some sort of unique gimmick involved with defeating them too, even if the end goal usually just involves you spamming them with berries until they die. So overall, the levels have a nice bit of variety across the board, and there's some replayability with collectibles as well, like getting each piece of grain in a stage, and searching out the four flick letters, or killing each enemy with a max power golden berry, or this awfully slow harvester thing, which allows you to kill enemies to collect berry tokens as well. Unfortunately, the game isn't without its issues. Flick actually does control well enough in this game, and there's a nice bit of momentum to his movement, but unfortunately, the game is plagued by the classic early 3D platformer camera. You'll spend a lot of time waiting for the camera to catch up to Flick, or it just getting stuck on objects. Also, graphically, it is a pretty ugly game in my opinion. The setting leads to a lot of very, very brown levels, and overall, the game can just look unappealing and a bit ugly at times. I'd expect better for 1998, but it really doesn't detract from the game experience overall. One last thing that I'd like to highlight is that the soundtrack for this game is actually pretty incredible. You often get some generic throwaway background music in the licensed kid game, but the music here is just so good. The menu teams, the upbeat stages, the dramatic boss battles, they really went above and beyond for the music in this game. And to be honest, it really does help elevate the game as a whole. Now overall I really enjoyed my time in A Bug's Life, it's not the prettiest game in the world and it does have some problems, but I found it to be a fun 3D platformer with a couple of unique ideas and a great soundtrack, so if you like the look of this one I would recommend giving it a try. Up next we have Disney's Tarzan, released in June of 1999 and developed by our old friends at Eurocom. You know, the Hercules guys. I'm starting to see a bit of a trend here, how long until you think we see our next Eurocom or Traveller's Tales game again? Tarzan actually shares a lot of gameplay elements with Hercules, and playing them both back to back it was pretty interesting to see some of the similarities. The big difference with Tarzan is that the game, while still majorly played on a 2D plane, is now entirely in 3D. A 2.5D game, if you will. And this changeover allows for some nice perspective changes while playing the game. When it comes together, it all looks really nice. There's even some later areas where you have full direct 3D movement over the characters, but these are few and far between and are also, uh, not good. Now something I thought was fun was that in the beginning of the game you play as young Tarzan and as you progress further throughout the game you begin to play as older Tarzan. You even get the opportunity to play as Jane and Turk in some stages but unfortunately there is practically no gameplay differences when playing as any of these characters. It might as well just be purely cosmetic which is a bit of a shame to be honest. So how does Tarzan play? Well it's what you'd come to expect at this stage, platforming with some action and the occasional gimmick stage thrown in. Now, a lot of the issues I had with Hercules still exist here, unfortunately. Uh, character control continues to be sluggish, and I actually found it to be even worse in this game, which makes the platforming and combat a little more difficult overall. 
Your main form of attack is throwing fruit, which is not too unlike another game we just saw. Uh, but fruit, once again, is unlimited. Uh, you can collect additional fruit that is limited and has a few extra effects. Although, to be honest, I never found these fruit did much over the basic attack option. So I mostly forgot they existed half the time. You can also get a small stone blade, which has such a slow response time and such an awful range that I just never bothered to use it, especially when I have access to an infinite range shot at my disposal. Like, honestly, look at how trash this is. What's even the point of using this? Why are they doing you dirty like this, Tarzan? Lastly, Tarzan can also smash his fist on the ground, which is used to access areas in the same way Hercules would with his stomp. Uh, these areas can house collectibles like letters, so Tarzan can spell his own name, I guess, baboon pages, or banana pickups for health. I did appreciate when this game tries to switch things up gameplay-wise, the stages where you're running away from Stampede actually played really well in this game, and some of the bonus stages were fun too. But these tree surfing sections are just awful. The sluggish controls on top of the very close-up camera just make reacting to things impossible. But I will say, I did get a kick out of the stage where you're playing as Jane and the whole jungle is just set out to murder you. Like it's almost comedically aggressive. Like come on guys, give her a break, she's just doing her best here. So Tarzan just kind of feels like 2.5D Hercules in the jungle, but also a bit worse. It can be somewhat difficult, the enemies again can be pretty cheap, and this is again somewhat offset by the amount of health pickups, but overall I feel like this game is harder for all the wrong reasons. A circumstance of poor controls and annoying enemies rather than a well implemented difficulty curve. Now the game is very pretty, but since the game takes place almost entirely in the jungle, the environments do begin to feel a bit samey as time goes on. Now it does have its moments and I did find myself warming up to the game the more I played it, but it seems like Eurocom just can't shake some of the lingering issues that held back Hercules from being a really great video game, and if anything the issues are just more prevalent here in Tarzan. It's still a great time, great if you're a fan of the movie, but still a step down from Eurocom's last effort in my opinion. Now here's hoping if we see another Eurocom game on the list we start to see some improvements or at least a change in their formula because at four games into the list it's already gotten pretty stale honestly and that's a shame because Tarzan really did deserve better. Ah, that's better. Ah, got it! So game number 5 is Toy Story 2 Buzz Lightyear to the Rescue, released in November 1999 and developed by our old friends at Traveller's Tales. If you bet that we were going to see another Traveller's Tales game immediately after the last game, well congratulations, you win! So this game came out roughly a year after Traveller's Tales last effort of Bugs Life, and once again this is another Pixar 3D platformer, but with a few changes this time around. This time they opted for a style similar to collectathon platformers where each level is an area that has a number of objectives to complete which reward you with some sort of shiny trinket upon completion. In this case, each level has 5 pizza planet tokens that can be collected. Uh, the objectives could be defeating a boss, winning a race, find the 5 lost sheep, collect 50 coins and bring them to ham, or just search out for tokens in difficult to reach areas. While you see these objectives may repeat throughout certain stages, the level design between each individual stage is so different, none of these objectives ever really feel stale at the end of the day, and your main goal should be just to explore each level and every part of the stage, and throughout this process, you should just naturally complete the objectives as you go. The game thankfully gives you the option of continuing on with a level after you've cleared each objective, so there's no Mario 64 jank here where you have to enter and exit the stage after each individual objective is complete, which is also nice to see. 
And speaking of levels, each area is incredibly fun to explore and takes good advantage of the perspective of your character. In this game you play as Buzz Lightyear on a quest to save Woody, and throughout the adventure you visit areas that are both from the movie and new to this game. But each stage takes advantage of the perspective of being a toy, which allowed the developers to design some fun levels with a lot to do, even if the levels themselves can be quite small. Each level feels compact enough with unique areas and landmarks to make traversing them incredibly easy. Throughout the game, you can also collect parts for Mr. Potato Head, which allow you to unlock upgrades for Buzz. These upgrades not only aid you in your adventure, but can also allow you to reach previously inaccessible tokens that were in past levels, so the game promotes some backtracking if you're attempting to collect every available Pizza Planet token. And while bosses can appear in regular levels, there are also some boss-only levels as well. But to be honest, these are all generally quite easy and you can just be brain dead and shoot or spin your way through most of these. I wouldn't really say the bosses are this game's strongest point, but the variety here is always appreciated. So far this all sounds great, but as we know, a game ain't nothing if it doesn't play well. And I'm very happy to report that Toy Story 2 feels excellent to play. Buzz's movement is snappy and his double jump allows for great control mid-air if you're trying to make trickier platforms. He can grab ledges, jump and swing from vertical and horizontal poles, and all of this just feels good and rarely causes much frustration. Really great 3D platformers live and die by their character's controls and movement in my opinion, and while Buzz certainly isn't perfect, it's a huge step in the right direction for Disney games going forward. The game features a healthy dose of combat as well. All the enemies are fittingly enemy toys, and Buzz has access to a close range spin attack or a long range laser attack. Both of these attacks can be charged to unleash a more powerful version of each, but since the laser is thankfully unlimited, I just found myself using the ranged laser attack most of the time because it sounds really cool and is fun to spam on enemies. Something even better is that sometimes you can find an upgrade around the stage to access the green laser. This isn't unlimited, but it does increase your laser's damage, and it has an amazing sound effect which sounds like it was ripped directly from a Star Wars movie. One last thing is that you can also change to a first person view which gives you better aim over your laser for attacking airborne enemies or even solving a few puzzles. Uh, another great feature is Buzz's big puddin head reflected on the glass on his helmet. Uh, the game just gets a few bonus points for that alone. Musically, it's another big win for Traveler's Tales with another excellent soundtrack, although if I'm being honest, it's not quite as good as a Bugs Life music, but the music is very catchy and suits each of the levels. It's always a pleasure to listen along while playing, and you can't really ask for much more than that, to be honest. Buzz Lightyear to Star Command. Come in, Star Command. So yeah, Toy Story 2 is a game I had a lot of fun playing. It's a pretty easy game overall, but engaging enough for players of any age. It's a great platformer to unwind with over a weekend, and while I wouldn't put it on a pedestal with the best platformers on the console, I'd still say it's one of the better Disney games ever made, and a treat for any Toy Story fan. I definitely wouldn't sleep on this one. So game number 6 finally sees us swapping over to both a brand new genre and a brand new developer. Released in November 1999 we have Magical Tetris Challenge, a Mickey Mouse Tetris game developed by Capcom, of all people. To be fair, it's not like Capcom doesn't have a storied history with Disney games having been responsible for some of the best Disney games ever made back during the 8-bit and 16-bit eras. It's just interesting to see them return here on the PlayStation with a Tetris game of all things. Interestingly enough, this game never saw release on the PlayStation outside of Japanese and PAL regions. We will be playing the PAL version today, but the game did see a earlier release in arcades and also a release on the N64, the latter of which was released in every region. So look, everybody knows Tetris. You line up different shaped blocks to create lines which score you points. The more lines you create in one go, the more points you get. 
There's definitely more nuance and skill to Tetris than my brief description lets on, but that is pretty much just the core of the game. And what a game it is, arguably the most popular game of all time. So, the question here is what makes this version of Tetris special? Well, long story short, it's got Donald Duck in a farmer outfit and jungle breakbeats. So in this game, you have three options of Tetris available. You've got your standard vanilla endless Tetris, which is par for the course. Up down Tetris, which pits you against an AI or local opponent with the aim of scoring more points and throwing off your enemy by dropping additional blocks on their side. And a third version of Tetris, which I believe is unique to this game called Magical Tetris. This is similar to up down Tetris, but instead of standard blocks, the game starts adding these incredibly unusual and large blocks into the mix. Uh, they can make the game very hectic and cramped, so if you're like me and pretty bad at Tetris, they're probably going to make your life a living hell. You'll also see extra things like combos, energy bars, and screen wipes, all things that feel like a Capcom edition. It all feels pretty arcadey, and that's not surprising, seeing as this game was also released in the arcade, so go figure. Outside of having Mickey Mouse and his pal standing around spinning a wheel all the time, the game also does feature a story mode. You have the choice of playing as Mickey, Donald, Goofy or Minnie and each character does have their own unique little story to follow along with but they all pretty much tell the same story. Donald finds a gem, Pete steals the gem, Gem brainwashes everybody, Mickey gotta stop Pete. It's about as bare bones as you'd expect and pretty much serves as nothing but an amusing segue from stage to stage. Where I think Capcom shine with this game is in the presentation. It's bright and colourful and the character sprites look fantastic. The actual game of Tetris is easy to play and read and best of all is the soundtrack. Capcom could do no wrong with music in the 90s and once again here they knock it out of the park with a soundtrack that honestly sounds more like it belongs in a Street Fighter game than a Disney Tetris game. But it's so good so it doesn't really matter. All in all, it's not the most feature-rich version of Tetris you'll come across, but a fine version nonetheless. You at home already know whether you like this game or not, but I think overall this is a pretty good version of Tetris, and the soundtrack alone makes this one of my favourite versions to play. Next up we have Disney's Activity Center of Bugs Life released in December 1999 and developed by Revolution Software under their kids Revolution Division. This here is a port of a PC game from Disney's Activity Center series. This is the first PC port we've seen on the list and it was also exclusive to PAL regions on the PlayStation. If you've ever played one of those activity centers on your PC as a kid, you'll know what to expect from this one. It's basically just the game where you click on everything you see in the hope that it does something cool. Your goal in this game is to find six items that are dotted around a bunch of different areas from the movie and pretty much everything is open to you from the get-go. There isn't really a whole lot to this game, just click on everything in each area until you get a prompt that might lead you to collecting an item. There's also a few other activities like this puppet theater that lets you make a short film out of some simple props and commands or this board game which can also be played with up to two people. It is pretty short and simple but it is fun for a game or two. I think as a PC port this isn't too bad, the mouse cursor controls are quick and smooth with the analog or D-pad, but unfortunately there is no PlayStation mouse support present in this game. The graphics look like they took a bit of a hit coming over from the PC though. Since this game tries to look like the movie using digital models and backgrounds, they can also kind of look bad in some scenes. It can also be difficult to sometimes make out the characters or what they're doing. I wouldn't say I find the style used in this game to be all that appealing to be honest, but it does work well enough even with my issues. 
Sound is also a mixed bag. There's a lot of voice work here, which is generally pretty great, but the mixing on the voices can sometimes be way too low for certain scenes, or sometimes it just cuts out altogether. The music here is fine. A lot of the areas actually have ambient background noise over music, but it does suit the scenes on screen pretty well. Overall, there's really not a whole lot to this one. You could probably see everything it has to offer in an hour or two, and as with activity type games, they are generally aimed at very young children. So if you pick this up expecting there to be much game to it, you'll be pretty disappointed. However, it is a nice attempt at porting that kind of experience over to the PS1, and kids should have a fun time with it. I am the strongest bug in the city. See? Oh, impressive. Rounding out the previous millennium, we have Disney's Mulan Story Studio, developed by Revolution Software, once again under their Kids Revolution division, and released for the PlayStation at the tail end of December 1999. Mulan Story Studio is another PC port of a game, this time from Disney's line of Story Studio games. This game is pretty similar to A Bug's Life, but the game follows a very simple linear narrative rather than just giving you access to everything up front. And since this was developed once again by Revolution Software, it functions exactly like A Bug's Life Activity Center. Controls are still pretty good, but once again, there is no mouse support here. This game is again what you'd come to expect from the genre. It brings you true and a bridge version of the story from the animated movie. Along the way, you'll solve puzzles, click on objects in the background to play animations, and play different mini games along the way. It's another very short and simple game, even more so than A Bug's Life, but I do think this game looks a lot better since the backgrounds and characters use the more traditional 2D animation this time around. The visuals can still look a bit choppy, but it's definitely a much better looking game. Once again, there isn't really very much to this one. It certainly seems like something I would have enjoyed when I was around 5 or 6 years old, but for anybody older, this isn't really a game worth your time. Although, this game does feature a pretty decent version of Mahjong for some reason, so, you know, if you like Mulan and Mahjong, this... This is the game for you. Match set point. Our first Disney game of the new millennium is Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour, released in March 2000 and developed by Crystal Dynamics, you know, the Gex and Soul Reaver people. I was actually pretty excited to try this one out since this is a traditional kart racer, one of my favourite genres of game, and it was developed by Crystal Dynamics, a studio I was a big fan of thanks to their output during the PlayStation 1 era especially. So it was exciting to see how their spin on a Disney kart racing game was going to turn out. Now, the most interesting thing about this game is that it's set in the Disney World Resort in Florida, and all the tracks are themed around different attractions in the park. You ever wonder what Space Mountain would look like as a racetrack? Well, wonder no more, this game's got you covered. This game actually has a story mode that tasks you with recovering parts for a fireworks machine that's needed before the park closes, or else there will be no fireworks show to close out the night. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been to a Disney park where they had to cancel the fireworks? I have, and let me tell you, people go fucking nuclear, so obviously this is something we need to resolve pretty quick. Now, the character selection in this game is really, uh, it's really weird. Right, so we got Chip and Dale donning their Rescue Rangers attire. Okay, very nice. Off to a good start. It looks like Jiminy Cricket is an unlockable character. Okay, cool. Everybody loves a classic, but we got a... Uh, Mo Whiplash. And Auto Plugnut. 
Oliver Chickley III, Polly Roger, and who could forget Tiara Damage, or everybody's favourite Big Chungus. So yeah, most of the characters in this game are just original creations and like, why? Was there an issue with putting other Disney characters in here? I feel a little let down here because some of these are actually really damn ugly, but hey, look, at least we have Chip and Dale, so it's not like we were going to be picking anything else anyway. Gameplay wise, it's fine. It's what you'd come to expect from the era. You hold the X button to accelerate, press the R1 button to hop and drift, use your drift to execute a boost, collect different colored balloons to get items, collect coins to increase your speed. You know the drill by now. I'm sad to say though, I just wasn't feeling this one, and keep in mind I really wanted to like this game. The car handling is pretty good, but the drifting is way too sensitive and easy to mess up. It's something I think you can get used to over time, but coming from other kart racers like Crash Team Racing or Mario Kart, you'll have a pretty hard time adjusting here. The boost system is fine, if you release your drift when you see green smoke, you get a small boost, and if you release when you have purple smoke, you get a large boost. If you hold your drift for too long though, you will spin out, which seems kind of weird, but the game isn't really designed to require large drawn out drifts. It's more geared towards quicker, sharper drifting. The items are also pretty lackluster mostly, just clones of Mario Kart weapons, although I did enjoy the missile that allows you to directly control it after it's been fired. I also found that getting hit by weapons in this game is pretty rough. Hitting a teacup, this game's version of a banana peel, traps you inside the teacup and slows you down and messes up your controls. And don't even get me started on the potion that turns you into a frog. It lasts for so long and dramatically speeds you down. A big part of the reason why these weapons get on your nerves is because the AI just feels really aggressive and difficult to overcome. It's not like they're even kinda hard for a kid's game, they're just outright really really hard to beat. If you get hit by literally anything, you're going to have a hard time getting back in the first place. The enemies aren't afraid to use shortcuts and are super aggressive and accurate with weapon usage. And I swear, in the last lap of every race, I got hit with something that resulted in me missing out in any possible chance of winning the race. Although on one track, I did set up a dangerous row of teacups over the course of the two laps. And on the third lap, I forgot about them and drove straight into them, absolutely blowing the race. So, look, maybe I'm just really bad. I don't know. The tracks themselves are fine, a few shortcuts and interesting sections throughout, although even though the tracks are based on Disney attractions, they do kind of feel uninspired. Big Thunder Mountain is a Wild West stage, Blizzard Peak is a snow stage, Epcot is a weird test center where you collect coins, I guess. I mean, they're fine, but nothing stood out to me as particularly cool or interesting, although I do enjoy that each track puts you in a different vehicle to match the overall theme of the attraction. Visually, the game is okay. It's not the worst looking game I've ever played, but by the year 2000, this looked nowhere near as impressive as other kart racers on the market. The draw distance also leaves a little bit to be desired in some areas as well. One thing I did enjoy was the music. The tracks used here are actually the same tracks used in the real attractions, which is a nice touch. You do get It's a Small World on the main menu, but unfortunately there is no Aerosmith on the rock and roller coaster track. You just get some generic butt rock instead. I do think there is some fun to be had in this game, but I was just not vibing with the drift controls, plus that combined with the brutal AI just put me off wanting to play more of this game. Also, I genuinely do think I'm probably just pretty bad at this game, so it could be that too. Maybe Walt Disney World Magical uh, Car Game featuring Big Chungus might be the game for you, but unfortunately it just, just wasn't for me. Game number 10 is Disney's Dinosaur, released in August 2000 and developed by Sandbox Studios. Now I'll be honest, I've never seen Dinosaur. When the movie originally came out, I had zero interest in seeing it. It just looked 
really weird and unappealing to me as a kid and as I got older I found out how it fared both critically and in the box office so it seemed that my kid intuition wasn't far off the mark. Likewise with the movie I pretty much ignored this game but I have read multiple pieces decrying this as one of the worst licensed games on the system so I was interested to at least try this out and see how it holds up after all this time. Maybe people were being hard on it thanks to their perceptions of the movie. I guess every game really does deserve a fair shot after all, right? Here I go. Okay, I hate it. So in Dinosaur, you play as a dinosaur, but not just one dinosaur, two dinosaurs, and also this uh, monkey thing. Actually, is it a monkey? I've never seen the movie, so I don't know. Let me just check real quick. Okay, here's a video. Maybe this will have the answer. What you need is a little help from the love monkey. The love monkey? Ow, baby! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry you all have to see that. But yeah, you play as two dinosaurs who I will now just call Sky Dinosaur and Land Dinosaur. And of course, the love monkey. So in this game, you are placed in a non-linear stage and tasked with a number of objectives. To complete these objectives, you need to take advantage of each character's abilities. The flying dinosaur can scout the map and transport certain objects. The love monkey can collect rocks to throw at enemies and also climb trees to collect fruit, which heals your characters. And finally, the land dinosaur can walk over rivers, which is needed to transport the love monkey who cannot cross them themselves. Uh, the dinosaur can also use his tail to smash rocks and wood, which can be picked up by the love monkey and sky dinosaur. And by utilizing all three of our characters' unique abilities, we can unite and save the dinosaurs, I guess. Well, no, because from here on out, everything in this game just falls apart. Everything in this game feels janky and unresponsive. Traversing terrain just feels like a chore or just sometimes doesn't work. The game's visuals are ugly. Fighting enemies, I mean... Look, I swear I'm doing my best here. I swear. The Sky Dinosaur can attack ground enemies, but it just like swoops down, does a little spin, and becomes impossible to control during the attack animation. And thanks to some, let's be polite here, wonky hitboxes, there's probably a 20% chance you're even going to hit the enemy you're trying to attack. The Love Monkey is also trash. The jump attack, trash. The rock throw, it's trash. The Love Monkey, trash. The ground dinosaur has a tailspin attack, which is by far the most consistent attack in the game, but even then, it's still wildly inconsistent and terrible. So, when you have a combat system like this, and one of the objectives in the first mission is to kill every other creature on the island, you're gonna have a bad time. For example, these enemies here, when you are lucky enough to hit them with the Sky Dinosaur, you do 2% of their total health. So you're only 49 hits away from killing one, and that will probably take you 200 or more total attacks to actually land hits to kill it. And even then, you have to kill two more after that. Okay, so how about trying the Love Monkey? He dies in one hit and is also trash. So that leaves the Ground Dinosaur. He does the most damage and has the most consistent attacks, so even though he's bad, this is by far the quickest and best way to kill these enemies. But still, he only does a tiny amount of damage and dies in just two hits, sending you back to your last save. I was honestly just gonna give up here and just bow out, but I persevered. I found some crystals that revive a character upon death, and I tried to just outjank the game and play fast and loose, and eventually, out of sheer luck, I managed to defeat every enemy on the island. So I thought to myself, look, maybe this game gets better. You seem to gain experience when you hit enemies, so maybe as you level up, the game balances out a bit. Maybe the objectives get better and more varied. Let's at least try the second stage and see what it's like. Yeah, no, I'm not doing this. Look, props to the game for trying something a little different, but it's just executed so poorly, I can't honestly recommend this game to anybody. Dinosaur is tedious and unfun. Just avoid this game at all costs.
Coming in at number 11, we have The Little Mermaid 2, developed by Blitz Games and released in September 2000 to coincide with the release of the straight-to-video movie The Little Mermaid 2. I've never seen it, but I'm going to safely assume it's pretty terrible. Uh, not going to lie, after playing through Dinosaur and heading straight into this game, my expectations were pretty low. How bad could a game based on a straight-to-video animated kids film be? It turns out, not that bad at all. Pretty good, even. So first things first, I think they did themselves pretty dirty by calling this game The Little Mermaid 2 when the game actually covers the events of both the first and second movie. I'm sure there's many people who just assume low quality since it's a game named after those much maligned straight to video sequels. They could have just called it The Little Mermaid and it probably would have been more appealing to people, honestly. Now when I say that they cover the events of boat movies, it's worth noting it's an extremely abridged version of boat movies. You get to play in some familiar locations and experience some of the bigger set pieces from the movies, but outside of getting a few cutscenes in between levels that use nice high quality footage from the movies, there's not a lot holding this together narratively. The game is a return to the 2.5D platformer style, and of course being The Little Mermaid you spend most of the game underwater, and this sounds like it could be a recipe for disaster because good water levels in video games are rare and bad water levels are plentiful, but thankfully keeping the game focused on the 2D plane means they just had to make sure it felt fun controlling a mermaid, and all credit you they actually managed to do it. The game feels kind of like a more relaxing, more linear Echo the Dolphin in some ways. The stages and graphics look great and the music is honestly really good too. You get some fitting underwater themes and the stages have enough variety in them to keep things fresh. Most of the stages require you to collect some item and solve some very basic puzzles. There's also 50 coins and 5 pearls in each stage too if you want to spend extra time exploring the levels. There's plenty of enemies throughout the stages and you have a variety of different attacks to deal with them, although more often than not I just found myself swimming around them most of the time. In later levels you sometimes play as Ariel's daughter Melody from the second movie. These stages can sometimes mix up gameplay with Melody needing to breed underwater when she's in her human form, or even some platform stages that take place on land with some unfortunately pretty awkward controls but the game is so forgiving and these sections don't pop up often so it's not something that ever really gets frustrating. And that's both this game's positive and its setback. It's incredibly easy, it's one of the most easy and relaxing games I've played on the PlayStation. It's fun to control, it looks nice and the music is great but there is basically no challenge to the game whatsoever. There's just over 10 stages total and each stage can be beaten in about 3-5 to five minutes on average the first time you go through. And this is with collecting most if not all of the collectibles on the level. This is obviously a game aimed at very young kids, and even so, I did actually enjoy it a whole lot, but it is a game that you'll play once, have a nice time with, and never come back to again. You can unlock some multiplayer bonus games by collecting enough pearls in each stage, but none of these are good enough to keep you sticking around after the end credits. All in all, I was pleasantly surprised by how good this game turned out to be, a really great effort from Blitz Studios, just held back by a complete lack of challenge and it's incredibly short length. I'd recommend giving this game a try if you like the look of it, definitely aimed at very young kids, but at its core it's a really nice 2.5D platformer nonetheless. Also when you throw stones at enemies in this one stage, it makes a really stupid noise. So 10 out of 10 for that I guess. Next up we have our first Winnie the Pooh themed game, and it doesn't even star Winnie the Pooh, go figure. Tigger's Honey Hunt is a 2.5D platformer developed by Doki Denki Studio and released to the world in October 2000, and stars everybody's favourite hyperactive bouncing tiger. This is another game that I had pretty low expectations for and ended up being pleasantly surprised by. This is still, at the end of the day, a very simple platformer aimed at a young audience, and while it doesn't pretend to be anything but that, it ends up being another competent 2.5D platformer for the PlayStation. The first thing I noticed about this game is how good it looked. Winnie the Pooh has always had this very nice storybook style with some notable usage of watercolours and the game captures this look really well in my opinion. The backgrounds look great, the models are clean and full of personality. All around this is one of the best looking games I've played on the list so far, really good stuff. 
The levels also have some nice variety to them too. While you could imagine a setting like the 100 acre wood only getting so much out of its woodland setting, the levels make good use of different colours and seasons to help make each area feel unique. In Tigger's Honey Hunt, levels are fairly straightforward. Your goal is to collect a target amount of honey pots and to get to Owl at the end of the stage. These are littered throughout the levels and pretty easy to collect as you traverse the areas normally. While doing this, you'll predominantly be platforming and exploring for hidden areas, searching for collectibles, and sometimes finding and returning a lost item hidden in the stage to one of your 100 acre wood pals. Given the age group this game is aimed at, the game, not surprisingly, is very easy. Platforming is very but rarely difficult, and while there are enemies, they are few and far between and super easy to ignore or dispatch with a quick jump. What did surprise me though is that the game went on the difficulty actually emerged in the form of honeypot quotas. While I was generally always searching for hidden areas, sometimes I came very close to missing out on the quotas even after finding said secret areas. Eventually, even after searching pretty hard for as many hidden areas as I could, I started failing to meet the honey quotas and had to replay the stages again. So while the game itself is very easy, it actually promotes some pretty hardcore exploration throughout the levels to actually beat them. The game does give some decent hints to secret areas, the formation of honeypots pointing in a specific direction usually being the main one, but many of them you'll have to search out yourself. They're hidden in areas that seem counterproductive to the flow of the levels. It's fine, but I feel like this artificially adds some challenge to the game while also interrupting the flow of the stages, plus it's never fun to have to replay stages over and over. Thankfully, Tigger is a fun character to control. He can be a little bit floaty, but nowhere near as bad as we've seen in Tarzan and Hercules. You start with only two abilities for Tigger, a crouch and a jump, but after playing through the game and beating these minigame sections, which are really long and boring, you do unlock a new ability for Tigger. I managed to unlock two during my time playing and gain access to a floating ability used to cover large distances and a spring jump used to access higher platforms and traverse traps throughout the stages. The level design changes up to put these new abilities to good use, so it did help keep the game fresh as it went on. One thing that took me a while to get used to though was Tigger's running animation. It's actually more of a hopping animation, which gives a sense that the character is jumping, but it kind of messed with my head seeing Tigger hop, because during the animation, it's as if he is still planted on the ground, but sometimes when you're coming to the edge to make a precise jump, Tigger is like already jumping. So you think you're right over the edge, even though you can jump again normally as if you're on the ground even though you're in the air. It's just a weird thing that messed with my platformer hand-eye coordination and it took me a little while to get used to. The game also has a nice soundtrack, nothing memorable but suitable for the game and setting. There's plenty of voice dialogue for each character which is nice and lots of good quality cutscenes taken straight from the Winnie the Pooh animations as well. All in all, this is another really competent if unremarkable game but for a Winnie the Pooh platformer aimed at a younger audience, it's a success. It's got enough variety and challenge to keep kids engaged but anybody but younger kids will probably tire of this pretty quickly. Still, it's something I'd suggest trying out if you're a fan of Winnie the Pooh or are just looking for something cute for your kids to play and hone their platforming skills on. You could certainly do a lot worse. Next up and starting a pretty big run of Disney PS1 games being released in November of 2000, we have Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. Traveler's Tales are back again with a Toy Story license, this time with a game based on the straight to video movie and animated series Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. I remember seeing trailers and adverts for this Toy Story spin-off when I was a kid, but I never watched it, but from what I gather, it's basically just Buzz playing Space Cop with his alien and robot pals. I don't know if it's actually any good, but if any of you watched it, let me know in the comments, because the game has a few cutscenes from the show, and some of them are, are actually pretty funny if I'm being honest, it looks pretty fun. So after Traveler's Tales' success with A Bug's Life in Toy Story 2, I was expecting this to be another 3D platformer, or at least another good video game, but I don't know what really happened with this one. Buzz Lightyear of Star Command is just a... it's a weird video game. If I was to try and describe to you what you do in this game, it's basically an action platformer run and gun, uh... racing? Chasing? Video game? Your goal is usually to race a criminal from the start of the level to the end of the level, after which you fight them in a boss fight. If you beat them in the race, you get an advantage in the boss fight. If you don't, you just fight them normally. 
Unless you're too slow and let the time limit run out, in which case I guess they just get away. This never happened to me while playing, so I don't know if that actually happens, but it seems like that would be the case. Throughout the stages, you can destroy enemies to get credits or just pick them up throughout the stage. These credits can be used to cash in for weapons and shields, activate jump pads, or gain access to vehicles later throughout the stage. All really with the purpose of helping you navigate the level quicker and have more firepower for the boss. When you do get to the boss, it will have a number of color-coded shields. These shields can only be damaged by certain color-coded weapons, which seem to just appear in the boss arena anyway, so you don't really need to worry about picking up anything along the way. I think my main issue with this game is that it's just really brain dead and simple. You kind of just steamroll through levels blasting whatever you can without thinking. You take pretty much no damage and health pickups are everywhere. The levels are also super short and basic, and the boss fights usually just come down to spamming the right color weapon without any taunt until it dies, and then you get a medal. There are five medals per level and you need medals to access new levels, so when you get one medal for racing the boss to the end of the stage, you can go back in and instead try a time trial of the level, which is basically the exact same thing but without the boss at the end. And then once you've done that, you can go back into the level again and collect missing robot parts with a time limit, which is once again pretty much the same thing. So your main gameplay is just time trials basically, and when the gameplay is just super brain dead, it's, I don't know, it's just really boring. You can also get bonus medals for doing things like collecting uh, aliens littered throughout the stage or getting a quota of credits, but none of this really does anything to complement the dull level design overall. Graphically, the game tried to go for a cell shaded style to match the animated series, I guess, but it just looks kind of bad here in my opinion. Levels look really bland considering it's a sci-fi setting and characters look either just odd or plain ugly. The game doesn't control great either, Buzz has this weird momentum that kind of makes him control like a vehicle instead of a person, but at least when you're on a vehicle, there's very little change to how it feels all around. Shooting is kind of awkward too, there's no lock-on function, and while there is a strafe, it's pretty slow and delayed. It works, but it feels kind of slow and wonky. Other than that, Buzz gets a jump, which can be used for some very light platforming, but it's as basic as it can be. The game is pretty much mostly just running and gunning in a straight line for the most part. After trying a few missions across the first five stages and seeing the sixth stage was set in the same area as the first, I had pretty much had my fill of this game. I, I don't know if the animated series is any good, but the video game feels like a budget straight to video version of a video game. It's actually pretty disappointing considering the quality of Traveler's Tales Disney games up until this point. Now look, I'm never against the idea of switching up a formula and trying something different. I don't expect Traveler's Tales to just make 3D collectathons going forward. But if you're going to try something new, at least make sure the end result is fun. Just because it's for kids doesn't mean the game gets away with not being fun. This just feels like a big misstep for Traveler's Tales. Here's hoping if we see them again on the list, they can bounce back to their usual level. Game number 14 is 102 Dalmatians Puppies to the Rescue, released for the PlayStation in November 2000. This game is a 3D platformer developed by our old friends from Crystal Dynamics who were responsible for Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour, which I wasn't all too fond of. Now you may remember in that video I mentioned that I was a fan of Crystal Dynamics games, particularly the 3D Gex games which were released earlier on in the PlayStation's life cycle. So I was particularly interested in trying this one out since I knew Crystal Dynamics had a proven track record in making good 3D platformers, but of course there's always the worry that the studio could turn out a quick cash grab for kids. So, this game loosely follows the plot of the 102 Dalmatians live action movie. Long story short, you play as one of two puppies, either Domino the boy puppy or Oddball the girl puppy, on a quest to save your brothers and sisters who have once again been dognapped by Cruella de Vil. The choice of playing as Domino or Oddball is nice, but it is entirely cosmetic outside of different voice dialogue during the game cutscenes. 
To be honest, I'm really impressed with the presentation of this game. Graphically for the time, it's nothing too special. Crystal Dynamics games have, in my opinion, never really been the cleanest 3D games, but they do kind of have a rough charm to them. They always tend to add a lot of variety and detail into their character and level design, so it makes up for it. This game in particular also has a ton of voice dialogue, and the cutscenes which are nicely animated are even pretty funny from time to time. They can pop up a bit too often in levels, but the characters offer some good hints and tips for younger players trying to navigate the levels, and they even got Frankie Muniz in to voice Domino, which is pretty cool. I'm looking for my brothers and sisters. I think they might be in trouble. The game follows a pretty standard setup, no hub worlds here, but a linear set of stages, broken up with Corella de Ville boss stages after every fourth level. This gives us a total of 16 stages with four boss fights, and the levels are pretty substantial too. Each stage is a new location within London. The game is a collectathon platformer set in open but mostly linear levels. These stages are generally pretty small but offer a lot of well designed areas which flow nicely from one to the next. Outside of reaching the end of the stage there are a total of 6 lost puppies, 100 bones and stickers which unlock after completing a specific objective in the stage. Collecting the puppies is the most straightforward task. These generally pop up naturally as you move through the levels so these are mostly pretty easy to collect in each stage. The bones are where the main collectathon aspect comes into play. These are generally dotted around the level for the most part, but the levels also have a bunch of toy enemies that you can defeat. Most of these will also spawn bones nearby when they're defeated, and there are also a bunch of hidden bones buried around each stage which you can dig up by holding the circle button to sniff out. There's even some bones that only spawn when you complete hidden objectives within the stage. For example, in the first stage there is this pigeon mining its own business. I couldn't damage it so I paid no mind to it. But as I progressed through the stage I noticed a weird pigeon statue. I tried interacting with it but nothing happened so once again I moved on throughout the stage and when I got to the end of the level I noticed I was still missing quite a large number of bones. So later on I came back to the stage and tried barking at the pigeon to get it to move towards the statue and hey wouldn't you know it I was treated to a dance scene, a sticker and a bunch of extra bones. Sometimes in stages you will also come across one of Corella's lackeys, which can't be damaged normally, but whenever they appear there is always a specific way to defeat them in the stage. So in the first stage, once again, Jasper appears, and if you lure Jasper over to this tree with the beehive, you can take him out and earn yourself another sticker. The fact that these kind of objectives are littered across the entire 16 levels means outside of the already pretty decent platforming for each stage, there is actually great incentive to explore and experiment too. The puppies control nicely too, not the tightest controls you'll ever see for this kind of game, but more than acceptable. You have access to a standard jump, no double jumps or gliding here, but also a short range bark attack and a roll attack. The bark will be your main attack in this game, easily dispatching most enemies, and the roll I generally use for quickly traversing levels and smashing open crates with puppies inside. The game actually reminded me a lot of Spyro the Dragon at first because the attacks are pretty similar to Spyro's with the flame and charge abilities, and in Spyro you rescue dragons uh, in open but mostly linear stages, and here in 102 Dalmatians you do the same thing but with puppies. Although, while I taught this at first, the level design and control is pretty different to Spyro. It actually does feel more closely aligned with what we would see in the 3D Gex games, but just a little simplified for this game. I was also really digging the music for this game. It reminded me a lot of the music from another Crystal Dynamics series called Pandemonium, a really cool and really weird 2.5D platformer which had two entries on the PlayStation. I looked it up and surely enough both games were scored by Burke Treisman. The music in Pandemonium was really weird but very catchy. It had a very very distinct style so seeing that style appear in 102 Dalmatians was pretty cool. The music here is definitely more lighthearted and childish but it has the same distinct style that makes it stand out and is a highlight of the game for sure. The enemies also sound really dumb sometimes, which is also a plus. On top of this, the game has a bunch of minigames too. They're nothing really worth writing home about, but they are more substantial and varied than what you'd usually expect. I got a kick out of the mini golf and tilt maze for a few minutes at least. So yeah, I don't know, this game is actually pretty good. Dare I say, even a hidden gem maybe? Like, I know Toy Story 2 gets a lot of praise for being a really good licensed kids game, and rightly so, but I never hear this game being talked about in the same breath. Or at all, really. Which is a shame. I mean, it's clear a lot of work and effort went into making this game. Now, don't get me wrong, it's still a game aimed at children, so it is very, very easy. The camera controls are decent, but it's still susceptible to the usual 3D platformer jank. Its mechanics and levels aren't the most complex, and while the presentation overall is great, it's not the best looking game considering it was released towards the tail end of the year 2000. But regardless, I actually had a lot of fun with this one. Really pleasantly surprised, to be honest. If you like these kind of games, but have never tried 102 Dalmatians, give it a try. Sure, what's the worst that can happen?
We're returning to another mainline Disney movie next with The Emperor's New Groove, released in a busy November 2000 and developed by newcomer to the list Argonaut Games. Argonaut has a fun history, they are actually the team responsible for teaming with Nintendo to create Star Fox and the Super FX chip of all things. They also developed Croc, the greatest mediocre game of all time. So it's not surprising to see them pop up here with a licensed kids game eventually. <laughs> the Emperor's New Groove is your basic 3D platformer. You play as Emperor Cusco in his llama form, and you've got access to a pretty standard list of moves. You've got your mandatory jump, a variety of attacks including a stationary punch, a roll attack while moving, and a karate kick from the air. You can also collect grapes, which will allow you to spit seeds as a projectile from a first person view. Lastly, you've got a charge ability, which works pretty similar to Spyro the Dragons if you're familiar with that. The major difference is that you've got a dash meter, which depletes on use, but can be filled by collecting idols, and the meter can also be extended by collecting coins littered throughout the stage. The gameplay in The Emperor's New Groove is pretty simple. Your goal pretty much is just to traverse the stage and find the exit. Perform some basic platforming, defeat enemies in your way, find objects to drop them on switches, collect keys to open gates blocking your progression. It's all pretty basic stuff. Cusco feels pretty good to control too. On the ground he feels tight and responsive, although the jumping can feel a little bit floaty at times, but the platforming here is pretty forgiving, so it's never really an issue. All around this is a pretty solid playing game. The problem is that the game is just kind of aggressively mediocre. It is about as bland a 3D platformer as you can get. There's nothing really terrible about the game, it's just pretty boring to play in my opinion. Levels often lack visual variety, you usually play 3-4 levels per area and the levels pretty much all look the same. And the level design, while pretty linear, can sometimes feel a bit maze-like, just broken up into small areas which all look completely alike. And after you've played one or two levels in the area, you feel like you've seen it all before. That being said, the game does offer a lot of variety outside of the standard platformer gameplay. There are parts where you transform into an animal, like here where you become a turtle to race Kronk down the mountain. There's a section where you're outrunning beasts in the jungle and have to perform a track and field style button bashing marathon to outrun them. There's also some stealth sections, an area where you have to navigate a maze with guards. There's even a whole chapter dedicated to one scene in the movie where you're attached to a log floating down the river. Once again, the problem is that outside of maybe the turtle race, which was actually pretty fun and controlled better than I had any right to, the changes in gameplay are also pretty boring and underwhelming, and in the case of the log section, they just long it stay their welcome. Four whole levels of just floating and dodging objects in the river with the odd turret section or race thrown in to mix things up, it's all just pretty boring, honestly. The graphics aren't even that bad. They're nothing really special for the year 2000. The character models aren't even the worst. It's just these bland, small, and uninspired stages over and over again. You take these and mix them with the pretty dull gameplay. It's just, it's just pretty boring. One thing I did really enjoy though was the music and sound in this game. There is plenty of voice acting and while the voices can sometimes sound a bit off for the characters, the voice work is well done and the writing is pretty funny at times too. It's one of those games that tries to break the fourth wall and look, credit where credit is due, some of it is actually pretty funny. Whoa, time out. Okay. In order to save me, you didn't I play this kind of game in the 80s? The soundtrack is also really good too. The music sounds like it's straight from the movie and complements the stage as well. Checkpoint. I also thought this game sounded a little bit like the excellent Croc soundtrack, and surely enough, it was done by the same guy, Justin Charvona. So great work, Justin. Two thumbs up from me. So yeah, I feel like this is the perfect baseline for what I expect a middle-of-the-road licensed kids game to be. Nothing particularly awful, it's just kind of a bland platformer for kids. There's nothing really exciting or good enough here to keep you interested, just the bare minimum. And look, to be honest, it's a fine game for kids, but as we've seen, kids games can be easy and simplified, but you can tell when it's been phoned in, and unfortunately that's kind of what it feels like here. If you owned this as a kid, you probably would have enjoyed it a lot, but nowadays, there are a lot better options out there, and to be honest, back in the year 2000, there was a lot better options available too. Let's have a look-see.
So our next game sees us taking the role of everybody's favourite duck with anger issues. Donald Duck Going Quackers was released in, you guessed it, November 2000 and developed by Ubisoft Shanghai. So this game is either called Donald Duck Going Quackers or Donald Duck Quack Attack, depending on where you live. Uh, but I'm going to be honest, I think Going Quackers is a terrible name, so I'm just going to stick with Quack Attack going forward. So in case you can't already tell, this game is a Crash Bandicoot clone. There's no real hiding it, I suppose. Narrow 3D platforming sections where you predominantly just want to move forward. 2.5D platforming sections, levels where you run away from some big yoke trying to crush you, warp rooms, time trials. It's just Crash, but with a duck in a cute sailor outfit. So that sounds great, right? Well, kinda. This probably won't come as a surprise, but the game doesn't really hold a candle to any of the original Crash trilogy. Keep in mind that this game also came out way after Crash Bandicoot 3 Warp, so the standard for this kind of game has already been set pretty high. That being said, this is a very competent attempt at making an even more child-friendly Crash-style platformer. Ubisoft have managed to make a game that controls great. Donald has a very limited moveset, basically a double jump and a standard attack, but Donald feels fluid and fun to control, and the level design complements the moveset nicely. It's a game that feels fun to traverse. Platforming is really tricky, but whenever I did fail, I knew it was my fault. There's no real getting mad at the controls in this game. That being said, Donald does get pretty mad if you fail a bit too much. So the worlds all follow a similar pattern. Two stages played predominantly in full 3D, two stages played in 2.5D, one bonus stage where you get chased, and then one boss stage. Your goal in the levels is to collect a single energy orb and finish the stage. Energy orbs are basically the crystals from Crash 2 and 3. These are rarely difficult to find, but they are definitely more out of the way comparatively to Crash, so there are occasions where I basically ran through the level without paying attention and beat it and then realized I just missed the orb entirely. So I don't know if you're playing this one, make sure to pay attention and don't be a dope like me. We've already mentioned that each level has a time trial similar to Crash from when you've beaten the level, but since there's no time boxes, special abilities, or platinum or gold variants for the time trials, this feels like a throwaway addition really just to pad out the length. Lastly, unlike the gems in Crash which see you destroy crates and stages, this game tasks you with also collecting three toys per stage. This is done by hitting a floating book and completing a short time trial to get them. Collecting all of these in each stage in a world will unlock you a bonus stage in each zone, but the real reason to collect all these toys is just to see Donald's dumbass celebratory dance. Donald just letting it loose. It's just pure duck arse. Fair play to him. Unfortunately, this game only has a total of four zones, with each zone taking only about 20 to 30 minutes to beat. Each level follows the zone's team, which also limits the amount of variety you'll see across each level. Like, the levels themselves actually look quite nice for the most part, but they just come off as a bit uninspired, especially for a game released towards the tail end of 2000. I will give credit to the bosses though, each of these were pretty fun and oftentimes challenging too. I especially like the second boss who would crack parts of the stage with a wrecking ball. The music in this game is fine too, nothing really memorable, but they do suit the stage as well. Donald Duck Quack Attack overall is actually a very fun game to play, it just can't shake feeling like a lower budget Crash Bandicoot clone with a Donald Duck skin over it. Being a big fan of Crash Bandicoot myself, I actually enjoy my time with this game a lot, but there is no denying that it's lacking the magic that made Crash the household name he is today. That being said, if you're looking for an easy short alternative to Crash Bandicoot featuring an angry duck, well then you can't really go wrong with this one. Dance Dance Revolution Disney Rave was released in Japan in November 2000 and developed by Konami. The game was later released in the West in September 2001 as Dance Dance Revolution Disney Mix. This is the version I'll be playing today. I'm mentioning the Japanese release as it's relevant to another upcoming game we'll look at shortly. So yeah, there's a Disney DDR game. I assume you all know what DDR is at this stage, the series is well past its peak cultural relevance, uh, but I don't want to understate how big the series was during the late 90s and early 2000s. 
A rhythm game that uses a dance pad and requires you to step on directional arrows to the beat of a song. It was fun, it was exhausting, and it was the best. Not quite the OG rhythm game, but DDR walks so games like Guitar Hero, Rock Band, and Just Dance could run. Hell, it's still seeing releases to this day. I checked when the most recent iteration of DDR came out, and it was literally the very day I was writing this, July 1st, 2020, which is kind of crazy. Naturally, I don't have a spare dance pad laying around my apartment, so I'm not playing this version of the series as intended, but thankfully the game is still a pretty fun rhythm game even using a controller. The face buttons and both analog sticks can be used to input directions, so you have a lot of flexibility to find a playstyle that suits you best. I've always known there was a Disney version of DDR, but never played it before. I assumed it would feature some well-known Disney tracks remix to suit the high-energy music the game is known for. Uh, at the time, I assumed showing off any tracks in this game would also hit me with a copyright strike, so I was just going to briefly show some gameplay and that would be it. But some of the music just really needs to be heard. And I've done a few tests and found that a very small number of the songs on the track list don't seem to flag YouTube's copyright system. So, at the very least, I would like to show you the It's a Small World Ducking Hardcore Remix. Get down! Be cool! So yeah, the soundtrack is actually insane. There's a few remixes of Disney songs, mostly older tracks remixed into Eurobeat or hardcore styles, but there's also a bunch of non-Disney tracks included too, covering a nice variety of genres like R&B and even disco, and yes, it's all really, really good. The main Disney aspect of this game comes from the characters and backgrounds being prevalent across the game. Outside of this, it is pretty much a PS1 era DDR game. Modes are limited, I mean you have your standard tree stage arcade mode, free play and a competitive mode for two players that you can also play against an AI opponent. But regardless of the limited modes, the core of DDR has always been about mastering the tracks and aiming to get the highest score possible. And between the tight gameplay and amazing track list, this is an all round great version of DDR. It even features a calorie counter and some basic info to allow you to track your weight and calories burned. Even in this limited form, this was way ahead of its time, incentivizing fitness up front and tying it directly into the gameplay. It's actually really, really cool to see. So look, clearly I like this game a lot, and honestly, your opinion of this game will come down to how you feel about DDR as a whole. It is certainly not for everybody, and yeah, it's a little light on content compared to later DDR games, but it's just a wacky, high-energy rhythm game with a great track list and a bunch of Disney characters moonlighting as DJs, which looks pretty stupid, but I don't know, it's great, it's weird, and it can only come from Japan. It just all works. I've never seen such a wonderful stage like this! So following up from one Japanese rhythm game from Konami, we now are going to take a look at another Japanese rhythm game from Konami. Poppin' Music Disney Tunes was released on the same day as DD or Disney Rave in Japan. The only difference is that this game never actually seen a release outside of Japan, thus making this the first Japanese exclusive Disney game on this list. I wouldn't blame you if you're unfamiliar with Poppin' Music. While it was very popular in its home country, this one never really made waves outside of Japan. Poppin' Music is a more traditional rhythm game opting for a massive 9 button controller setup over the more high energy dance pad control method of DDR. If anything, this game shares a lot more in common with one of Konami's other big rhythm series, which is called Beat Mania. Uh, that game opted for a turntable style controller. 
So yes, Konami have a lot of rhythm game series, guitars, drums, big fucking buttons, they've got you covered. So now we know what poppin' music is, and while Disney DDR offered up some wild, frankly amazing remixes with tight gameplay, poppin' music is a little different. Yeah, so poppin' music, while pretty weird, is a lot more subdued than DDR. We still get a bunch of Disney remixes to play through, way more Mickey Mouse-specific ones than what we've seen in DDR, but overall most of the tracks just don't have the same kind of oomph or enjoyability that the music in DDR does. Poppin' music, as the name implies, is more pop-focused, while DDR is more dance-focused. And while I actually quite like pop as a genre, the music that's here just doesn't do it for me like DDR does. Also something that a lot of Konami rhythm games do that's seemingly absent from DDR but present in most of their other games, is that when you press a button in the game, an instrumental noise will play for each of the button presses. These can actually sound pretty out of sync with the background music, and in my opinion, these sounds can be sometimes a little bad when played over the music. I find it hard to get into a nice flow when everything just sounds really off sometimes. I figured this is done to make the notes more audible in an arcade setting, but at home, it's just not really working for me, unfortunately. Now, I said earlier that I don't have a dance pad laying around my apartment, but funnily enough, I do actually have a big 9-button controller specifically made for this series of games. And why is that? Because I'm a fucking loser. Unfortunately, that controller only works with the Sega Dreamcast, so I won't be able to use it here while playing this. I will have to opt for the PlayStation controller instead to play this game, and that's where we run into a few more problems. While playing DDR is rather straightforward on the PlayStation pad, the 9 button layout can be very confusing to get your head around. Trying to play this with all 9 buttons on a difficult track just made my brain shut down completely. There is an easier 5 button mode that is certainly better for beginners, but even with some practice, swapping back over to the 9 button option just felt like hitting a brick wall for me. This is compounded by the fact that the game doesn't tell you which button is on the screen. Uh, this alone was the biggest obstacle setting me back, and to be fair, there is seemingly an option to turn on button indicators, but since this game is all in Japanese, I could just not figure out where the option was to turn it on. Believe me, I tried, but the game is seemingly super obscure as well, so there's literally no English guides online to help navigate the menus, so it's not really the game's fault that I can't read Japanese, but do understand that this is a roadblock if you're a dumb idiot like me. So is poppin' music a bad game? No, not really, you just need a very specific setup to enjoy it. As a rhythm game, it is super challenging but also very rewarding to master, and anybody who enjoys this series will tell you that you need to own a poppin' music controller to play this game properly. And I can attest to that. The series is actually a ton of fun with the right controller, it's just in this case the lack of a proper controller, the language barrier, and the weird set list of tracks which after playing DDR beforehand just felt really subpar in comparison. I mean, if you can vibe the turkey in the straw, by all means you do you, it's just never going to compete with the zippity doo dah Eurobeat remix. So in my opinion, while the series is fun, this is really a game for hardcore fans of pop and music only. The Mickey Mouse characters and backgrounds are still great to see, they are nicely done, visually it is another fun and colourful game, it's just if you were to go with one Disney rhythm game on the system, DDR is far and away my preferred choice. Well, 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 if it isn't rhythm game season. Finally moving on from November, we have our first game released in December of the year 2000, and that is the Jungle Book Rhythm and Groove, developed by Ubisoft. This game had a name change for PAL regions going by the Jungle Book Groove Party over here. I don't know why they did that, that's just how video games be sometimes. 
Rhythm and Groove is another take on the DDR style of gameplay, so naturally this game came released in a bundle with a dance mat, but of course any other dance mat controller or a standard gamepad will do you just fine here. Once again you can use the face buttons to input directions, but sadly it doesn't seem like analog input is featured in this game. I think of all the Disney series to choose for a rhythm game, The Jungle Book is actually a pretty good choice. It has some of the most well-known and likeable music of any Disney feature film, and the upbeat music lends itself nicely to stepping on the floor. So I was interested to see what Ubisoft was going to go for. Thankfully the game, at the bare minimum, functions really well. The game uses the familiar system where inputs fall from the sky, and you need to press the corresponding input as it lines up with a marker. Everything here works as it should, and at its core it is a fun, functional rhythm game. Something unique to this game though is its power up system. During a song a special input might pop up and you've got to press that specific input in between your regular inputs. And if you manage to do that and continue the normal track without messing up you can activate a power up. These power ups can change from multipliers, a firewall that clears notes automatically for a brief period of time, even a notes challenge where if you hit a certain section in a row you get bonus points. Some of these power ups also seem to be detrimental as well, I've come across some that make hitting inputs much much harder, and while I'm sure there are bonuses for hitting the notes, these can easily put an end to a perfect combo during a song, so it's something that you may want to look out for. I thought overall this was a fun feature, not something I'd like to see in a more serious rhythm game like DDR, but it is fun to see something different here. The music here is thankfully really really good, the game goes for a mixture of remixes of classic songs from the movie, while also adding some original songs as well. And despite all aiming to fit within the Jungle Book aesthetic, they managed to pack a lot of variety into the music too. You can play through a story mode which has some pretty decent 3D cutscenes, briefly covering the plot of the movie. That can be done with either one or two players. Now while the songs are good, and you even get to partake in a couple of boss fights which use the bonus input system as a way to attack the bosses, the game is just way too light on content overall. This game only has a track list of 9 songs total, and yes the songs in this game are much longer than what you would see in DDR with tracks in this game lasting 3-5 to five minutes in total, it's just not enough variety to make it stand against other games in the genre. There is a versus mode and even some unlockable difficulties which is nice, the game itself is a bit easier than most rhythm games which is to be expected, but even at its highest difficulty this isn't something more serious players would ever struggle with. Presentation wise it is a nice game, the levels and stages can feel a little bare bones but the models and dances are pretty fun, it's not like you'll ever really be paying attention to them when you are focused on the falling inputs anyway. The graphics for the notes themselves though look a bit basic to be fair and some of the bonus powers can look a little cheap or distracting too. I mean it does get the job done but it's missing some of the polish and flair the Japanese games in the genre usually have. Also I might have lied, I did actually discover a 10th song in the track listing after noticing a Lou Bega challenge section in the menu which uh, allows you to attempt a Lou Bega cover if I want to be like you and if you beat this challenge you unlock the ultimate reward, a whole Lou Bega music video. I'm the king of the swingers, all the jungle VIP. It's pretty fucking bad though. So that's The Jungle Book Rhythm and Groove, another fun rhythm game that's unfortunately a bit lacking in content for anybody outside of the most hardcore Jungle Book fan. Still though, if you're a fan of the movie, the soundtrack, or just looking for a beginner's dance pad rhythm game, this is a very very good choice for you. So rounding out the year 2000 we have The Lion King Simba's Mighty Adventure released in December and developed by Paradox Developments. This here is another 3D platformer that tries to emulate the Crash Bandicoot style of gameplay. We got fully 3D levels, 2.5D side scrolling sections and levels where you are running towards the screen while being chased again, so nothing unusual here. This game actually takes place across both the Lion King and the straight to video follow up The Lion King 2. And in Simba's Mighty Venture you play as surprise both young and later older Simba and are tasked with collecting a quota of tokens with 500 tokens available in each level and then reaching the end of the stage. These tokens are placed all across the linear levels and can be obtained from defeating enemies as well. The different colour tokens each have their own value but honestly most are so easy to obtain it's not even something you'll ever really think about while playing. 
There's also Simba letters and fruit to collect on each stage, and the odd boss fight at the end of some stages as well. But there's no sign of any sort of Crash Bandicoot style time trials in this game, and honestly, it's probably for the best. So here's the thing, this game is, is, is bad. It's really, really bad. Immediately as you start the game, you'll begin to notice how awful Simba feels to control. He takes a moment to pick up momentum as he starts moving, and making any sort of sudden stops or turns just awkwardly halts the character, and it just makes doing anything in this game really awkward. It's most noticeable when you try to jump after moving from a stationary position, it just kind of feels like Simba is being pulled back while jumping. Controls this bad pretty much right the game off straight out the gate, but it actually also gets worse. Your attack options are also very limited. You have a roar, which is almost entirely useless. You can jump on enemies, which is awkward thanks to the controls. Or you can also roll at enemies, which is also still awkward, but your most consistent attack available. If you bump into literally anything, Simba gets stunned for a second and you have to pick up your momentum again. The platforming levels start off pretty easy for the most part, so you can kind of just fumble your way through them without issue. Controls in the 2.5D sections are still awful, but more manageable compared to the 3D sections. They are by far the most playable sections of the game, but even then are just unenjoyable and awkward to play. Once you get to the third level and try out your first chase level though, the game just goes to shit. The awkward controls are mixed with cheap enemies and off-screen obstacles that are just so hard to avoid and do tons of damage to Simba. It's not even like the section itself is hard, it's just a mixture of all the initial problems mixed in with some awful level design, combining it into this frustrating and cheap level. The pure definition of anti-fun. You may also notice that the camera is just a bit too zoomed in for the 3D stages which can make it difficult to see what's coming ahead of you, so you can often just walk into enemies or even pits which are also really hard to react to with the sluggish controls. It's just another factor that magnifies the game's other problems. Also the boss battles. Yeah, I mean, what did you really expect here? The Lion King is also a pretty ugly game. Levels can look very bland and barren. Character models are pretty poor. I mean, look at Scar here. Is he doing alright? Like, is he okay? Also, look, I get that it's the Lion King, but there's just so many levels that take place in different rocky locales. It's so, so boring. The 16-bit game has this. Look how good this looks. Also, the fire level, everything just looks really bad here. Like, what is this fire effect in the background? What's even going on here? Like... Thankfully the game is super short with only 9 levels, there's also a bunch of minigames, but these are probably the worst minigames I've played on the list so far, and that's really saying something. This Whack-A-Mole minigame is so, so bad, like how do you fuck up Whack-A-Mole? So look, it is a short game that can be beaten in under an hour, but it is just such a bland, frustrating experience. Outside of maybe Dinosaur, this is the worst game I've played on the list so far. It is a poorly made cash grab of the Lion King license, and just an unfun game across the board. Please don't bother with this one. Checkpoint. Game number 21 and our first release of 2001 is Toy Story Racer, developed by our old Pixar pals at Traveller's Tales and released in February of that year. After being both pretty disappointed by Walt Disney Magical Racing Tour and Traveller's Tales' last attempt at a Toy Story game with Buzz Lightyear Star Command, I'm hoping with Toy Story Racer we actually see a return to form with a good Disney kart racer for the PS1. Toy Story Racer can be played with up to two people and features your standard kart racer and arena battle gameplay. Since you're playing as toys, all the racers use tiny or sea cars to race around the tracks, and the game takes advantage of the perspective by letting you race in places like Andy's house, attics, the neighborhood, and even shopping malls. All these tracks are designed to take advantage of the small size and allow for some unique areas all within a small location. Andy's house, for example, starts on the landing, takes you down the stairs, through the living room, then into the kitchen, then you go up through the vent, into the bedroom, and then up into the attic, and then back down again onto the landing. 
The Battle Arena follows a similar trend taking place in areas like Pizza Planet with cool arenas like an arcade or bowling alley. Overall, I think the actual track design is pretty good and represents the Toy Story theme very well. What really sets this game apart though is how it controls. There's no drifting or jumping in this game. Each card controls very tightly with how sharp the turns in this game can be. The gameplay kind of focuses on the idea of pivoting your card into turns a little while before you actually get to them. This didn't take long to get used to and I actually found it really fun and responsive while racing. You can make precise turns into shortcuts and try to save off some time from your laps while cutting corners very tightly from the ideal angle. The tracks also feature some nice terrain differences where the cart handling noticeably changes from driving on different surfaces like grass or snow or pavement or whatever. Overall, the game is a really fun kart racer on the gameplay front with a unique handling system that sets it apart from most others in the genre at the time. As expected, it also includes a bunch of weapons as well. These are collected by hitting different colored boxes while racing. Each box color has a total of two different weapon types and oddly the boxes just kind of seem to randomly spawn in and out on the tracks rather than having a set spawn location for each map, which is kind of weird. I wasn't really a fan of that. Honestly, the weapons in this game are kind of trash. All the racers are so small, it's very easy to avoid most weapons, and nearly every item outside of the shock and speed boost are just really bad. At least you can hold onto weapons, and it can act as a shield, so between that and the small stun time when getting hit, weapons are actually pretty trivial during racing-only events. Unfortunately, the poor weapons turn the battle arenas into a really monotonous and dull experience. They can take so long to finish since it's so hard to hit enemies or even just get hit yourself. And when you're driving around for ages hoping to spawn a decent weapon or hoping that your enemy isn't just sitting on a weapon using it as a shield, it can feel like it drags on for ages and just isn't fun. So knowing this, we can look at the single player content for the game and believe me, there is a ton of it. At the beginning of the game, you have access to four racers and each character has a bunch of individual challenges exclusive to that character. And by beating them, you can unlock more challenges and even more racers with their own unique challenges. Sounds great, right? That's a huge amount of content for a game like this. The problem is that so much of the content is recycled and reused across each character. You will race the same tracks over and over and over again before you begin to unlock any new stuff. And even when you do, because there's so many challenges per character, it's only natural that even when you do unlock everything, you're going to be racing the same few tracks over and over and over for a very long time. Now, to be fair, they do mix up the races a bit with lap trials, item hunts and knockout races, but there's still so much repetition. It got boring just after an hour into the game for me. And also, a big chunk of these challenges are also battle stages and battle races. And as mentioned, with the poor weapons, the challenges are just not fun at all and tend to drag on for so long. So to unlock everything, you've got to actually play through a whole bunch of these as well. Presentation wise, it is pretty nice, but nothing special for the time. The stages and racers all look pretty good. And while it's not the most colorful or clean kart racer around, it does the job and runs pretty well too. The music as expected from Traveler's Tales is also pretty good here. This game is actually pretty disappointing, honestly, because the racing here is actually a ton of fun. There's a bunch of characters to unlock and the tracks are well designed and the car handling is really great. It's just the challenge system relies so much on making you play the same content over and over in quick succession and none of the battle racing or arena content was enjoyable for me at all. It feels like half a good game and half a bad game. It's just you gotta play the bad half to enjoy the good half too. I think it is better than Magical Racing Tour just from how good the car control is alone. But between the two of them, I don't think there's any reason to play these over, say, like Crash Team Racing or the myriad of other better kart races on the system. Here we have Disney's Aladdin in Nasira's Revenge, released in March 2001 and developed by the returning Argonaut Games. I think it's important to highlight that at this stage in the PS1's life cycle, we were pretty much well into the next generation of consoles. The Dreamcast was already on life support in the West, and the PS2 was already out on the market with the GameCube and Xbox coming close behind, so very few developers were really aiming to develop the next big thing for the PS1, especially when it came to a licensed kids game. 
So I feel at this point it was more common to see cheap cash grabs appear in the system compared to what we would have seen in the previous years. And in the case of Aladdin Nasira's Revenge, we get a new story based around Nasira, Jafar's sister. And guess what? She's trying to resurrect Jafar. And yes, it's a cheap cash grab. This game is a lot like Argonaut's last Disney game, The Emperor's New Groove, just a bit worse in every single way. You mostly play as Aladdin in this game, and this here is another 3D platformer with a bit more focus on action and exploration this time around. The platforming and controls are mostly fine, but they can feel kind of wonky and unresponsive at times, and whatever combat there is just feels super brain dead and janky. You can attack with your sword and block, but there's like never been a case where just spamming the sword hasn't been the most viable option available. You can also throw fruit to stun enemies or aim from first person, which is needed for some puzzles. All super basic stuff. There's also a ground pound to hit small enemies, but it's, it's pretty trash to be honest. Once again, the game has all the same issues as The Emperor's New Groove. Bland locations, areas that are repeated often, sometimes maze-like in design, and just an absolute chore to explore to be honest. Also, the awful draw distance returns again. It doesn't really affect the game here much, but it is genuinely distractingly bad. Also, speaking of distractingly bad, these are some of the worst 3D models we've seen yet. You get to play as Abu for some levels, which is pretty much no different to playing as Aladdin outside of having a wall jump. The boss fights, they're awful. The bonus stages... Look, I'm just going to show you a clip from each bonus stage I tried, and hopefully you too can feel the pain I felt playing these. I held out for a cool magic carpet section, and thankfully there was one. Yeah, it was the... it was the worst part so far. I did eventually get to a new set of levels called the Oasis, which left a pretty good first impression. Yeah, so it was around here I decided I needed to stop playing this game immediately. So, at best, this game is painfully average, a copy-paste Disney action platformer that plays okay, but it is just boring and uninspired. And at its worst, it is a janky, unplayable mess. I also forgot about the cutscenes, which are possibly the worst we've seen yet. I know Argonaut is actually capable of a lot better than this, so it's clear these games were just churned out quickly for some quick licensed game cash. This is hardly the worst Disney game on the list, but it's probably the most boring I've played so far. I would just ignore this one if you're an Aladdin fan. You've got two great platformers available for the Mega Drive and SNES, just, just go play them instead. Game 23 is the video game adaptation of Atlantis The Lost Empire, released in June 2001 and developed by Eurocom Entertainment Software. Wow, remember Eurocom? It seems like so long ago since we played a game from them. This here is actually Eurocom's attempt at a game with full three-dimensional movement. I remember trying this game as a kid, I went to see the movie Atlantis when I was like 10 years old, and I loved it a bunch. To this day, it's still one of my favourite Disney movies in spite of its many flaws. The next week I rented the PS1 game with my pocket money over the weekend, and this is the only time I've ever played the game, and I have just vague memories of it being very hard. I never finished it, and it's been so long since I played it, so this will be practically brand new to me. So let's see what Eurocom has cooked up since Hercules and Tarzan. Interestingly, Atlantis foregoes the traditional platformer style we're used to, and opts for more of an action-adventure style game. You'll spend a lot of time exploring areas, searching for switches, collecting items and solving puzzles, with a good chunk of action and the odd platforming section too. 
This game actually kind of feels like a dumbed down Tomb Raider for kids, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and it's not just because the inventory system in Atlantis looks the exact same as Tomb Raider's inventory system. The switching gameplay makes sense since the movie is all about a crew of people with different skills working together to uncover the lost city of Atlantis. So an adventure game complements the themes of the movie better rather than, I don't know, just jumping our way into Atlantis. The game starts out straightforward enough with you playing as Milo, while the game slowly introduces you to its mechanics. You can jump, punch, climb, use a projectile, in Milo's case a boomerang. Although the main core of the gameplay is finding items, using those items to access new or hidden locations, so you can acquire more items which can be used to access more new places. Another mechanic that's available from the second level is the ability to change characters. There's a total of four playable characters from the beginning, with Kida, the fifth character, being unlocked once you reach Atlantis, and each character has their own abilities and skills that make them necessary for completing levels. Milo can read Atlantean and climb, Molier can dig in special dig spots, Audrey can fix machines and light up dark areas with flares, Vinny can blow stuff up and push heavy objects. Each character has their own projectile attack and different run speeds and jump heights as well. These radios can be used to change your character but also uses checkpoints and to save your game as well, which is pretty necessary as these levels can be pretty long. Some of the levels can last anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes, assuming you don't get lost or need to backtrack much to swap characters when their abilities are needed. Thankfully, I found the levels generally flowed pretty well and the game does at least give you the option of choosing characters that will be useful in the area, so it keeps the gameplay focused and doesn't leave you guessing too often. There's some nice variety in the play too, there's multiple vehicle sections which surprisingly are actually kind of fun. They're a bit basic but they control well and have a good chunk of action in them, except for the drill section where you just hold accelerate for a minute or two and hope you don't die. Eurocom always like to throw in some gimmicky levels into their Disney games and I think this is their most successful attempt yet. Nothing spectacular but the levels were fun for what they were. There's also some cool non-linear sections too, like when you reach a level called the Cove, where you're tasked with finding two gems to access a cave hidden in the water. Within the stage, there is an entrance to both a fire and ice team level, which can be played in any order, which are required to actually complete the Cove stage and move on with the game. It helps make the game feel a bit larger and more connected. Also, we can't forget Old Faithful, every level does have a bunch of collectibles, including letters that you can collect to spell the name of the movie, which unlocks clips from the movie. Okay, so maybe this actually is just a low-key collect-a-thon platformer, but whatever. The presentation of Atlantis was also pretty good, the soundtrack complements the level as well, and the character models have this really nice cel-shaded style. They look great and are pretty detailed for the PS1. The textures and levels are also really clean, it's a good-looking PS1 game all round. Unfortunately, some of the levels can feel pretty open and barren most of the time, lots of large repeating areas with not a lot of stuff in them. And since the levels are pretty long, they can feel like they kind of run out of steam about halfway in. There's a good number of enemies in some stages, and combat for the most part is simple and responsive. Although you can oftentimes find yourself getting hit with projectiles from off screen. Health is regained in this game by finding food and med kits which can be stored in your inventory and used whenever. Some enemies can even poison you which slowly ticks away at your health. This can be healed with an antidote. Thankfully I always had a good number of these on me but it means you'll need to be cautious with certain enemies. The combat here is functional at least but it's still pretty boring for the most part. Usually just handled by spamming your projectile attack as always. Unfortunately, Eurocom's slightly off-character control returns here in Atlantis as well. Your character feels pretty good on the ground, but they just feel a bit light on their feet, almost like they're on a very thin plane of ice. The game is mostly pretty slow paced, so it's never really an issue, but when more difficult and precise platforming begins to show up later in the game, it can be a bit of an issue. The jumping is also kind of strange. It's easy enough to control mid-air, but once you land, you kind of just cease all momentum, which feels really odd. If you're trying to go over a string of platforms, you kind of just have to get used to stopping and starting over and over. You get used to it, but it still feels pretty weird. Also, I think it's important to highlight this is the only game I've played so far that has camera control mapped to the right analog stick. I've checked the option for every game I've played so far, and while many games certainly would have benefited from this, this is in fact the only game I've found with it so far. So a gold star to Eurocom for being so sound. I don't know, I feel like playing the game this time around, I actually enjoyed it more than when I played it as a kid. Maybe it's just because I've played so many similar games back to back to back to back that this genuinely feels like a unique game in the Disney PS1 library. It's not perfect by any means, there's flaws with the controls, the combat is super basic, some of the levels can drag on for way too long, but there's some good variety here and a decent challenge as well for a kid's game. I know I mentioned previously that at this stage in the console's life cycle we start to see more cheap cash grabs like The Lion King, like Aladdin, but for all its flaws Eurocom clearly put a lot of effort into this one. Because of the length of the levels I probably spent the most time playing this game out of all of them. It had its ups and downs but at the end of the day I had a good time with this one. I'd recommend checking it out if you like the look of it.
Next up, we're returning to a classic Disney character in Goofy's Funhouse, released in June 2001 and developed by the Code Monkeys. Goofy's Funhouse is exactly what it says on the tin, a game where you explore Goofy's house and have fun along the way. That really just is the core of the game here. Long story short, Goofy wants to watch some home movies, although Goofy has somehow misplaced all his movie canisters around his house, and you are tasked with finding all 50 movie canisters and some other objects to help complete his home movie collection. To do this, you just explore Goofy's house and interact with things. If you see an item, interact with it. Sometimes nothing will happen, sometimes something will happen, and sometimes you might even get a movie canister. You explore all the rooms in Goofy's house and garden until you collect all the canisters. That's pretty much the whole core of the game, and it does not take long to find all 50 canisters, maybe 25 to 30 minutes tops. This is very clearly a game aimed at young kids. It's essentially one of those simple adventure games where you click on stuff to see what sort of funny interaction happens, but instead you just walk around with Goofy instead. It's not awful, if I'm being honest, the house is kind of fun to explore, some of the visual gags are pretty funny. I could watch Goofy slip on oil all day, to be honest, but genuinely, it is one of the most simple games I've ever played. The game is also super choppy. I think the areas and models are nice and colourful, but the way this game runs and how everything looks... I mean, any section where you're in the house, the game just struggles to run smoothly. Goofy also controls like a tank. Not quite tank controls, but just slow and unwieldy enough to basically feel like you're playing a survival horror game in Goofy's gaff. Also, this jump is one of the slowest, heaviest jumps I've ever experienced in the game. Thankfully, there's only a single platforming section in Goofy's basement, which after failing to make it to the first platform after three attempts, I just ended up cheesing instead to save me the pain of having to go through it. To be honest, with the slow pace and simplicity of exploring Goofy's house, the controls, even though very bad, never really interfere with the gameplay, so they're rarely frustrating at least, just kind of bad. So we know the core of the game is exploring Goofy's house for film reels and items. Some of these items can be used to complete movie posters. This is where the other aspect of the game comes into play. Collecting these items gives you access to five different minigames. Most of these are pretty quick to finish. The golf game on the other hand does give you a full nine holes, which is nice, but you'll rarely spend more than a few minutes on any of these. But when you beat one of these games, you then gain access to the best part of the game, a full Goofy animated short themed after the mini game you just played. These shorts aren't only excellent, but the quality of each is really good too. And if you manage to collect all the film cans, you gain access to a bonus sixth animated short as well. None of the games I've played so far feature any full watchable content like this. It's actually pretty unique for the time and is a really cool feature of this game. So in the end, Goofy's Funhouse feels like a cool collection of Goofy short films with a super basic adventure game and minigame collection tacked on. This is clearly a game aimed for very young kids, and I could see a kid having a great time with this one, but there's a little over an hour's worth of content, and the game really is just too basic for anybody but young kids to actually really get some fun out of it. The inclusion of Goofy's animated shorts is really cool, but while this was a nice selling point back then, it's so easy nowadays to just pop online and watch any of these at a moment's notice, rather than have to waste your time playing through some super basic mini games instead. Regardless, it has its charm and it is a nice game for kids, plus it is kind of hard to hate on Goofy. I mean, look at him here, slipping on oil, the big dumb idiot. Ow! Now what am I gonna do with a flat tire? Hey, there's something under the car. I wonder what it could be. For game number 25, we're taking a return to Pixar for Monsters Inc. Scream Team, released in October 2001 and developed by Artificial Mind and Movement. They sometimes use the abbreviation of A2M and for some reason they have to change their name to Behavior Interactive. I wonder why. So this is actually the first Pixar PS1 game in a long time that hasn't been developed by Traveler's Tales. Now we could count a Bugs Life Activity Center, but that's really a whole different kettle of fish. Now while not every Traveler's Tales game was great, I would say they were responsible for some of the best Disney games on the system, so it'll be interesting to see if A2M can live up to or even exceed the standards set by Traveler's Tales.
spoiler, they do not. So Monsters Inc. Screen Team is, you guessed it, a 3D collectathon platformer. In this game, you play as either Mike or Sully. This game takes place in between Monsters University and the first movie, so you're basically taking your entry test to become part of Monsters Inc. And to get in, you need to play through a bunch of simulated levels and practice scaring kids. But because the monsters are sound, they decide not to trap real kids inside of a simulation. Instead, they opt to use robotic kids instead, which are called nerves. In each level, you have a total of three medals to obtain. You can obtain a bronze medal by finding and scaring five total nerves. You get the silver medal by collecting the 10 monster tokens. And you get the gold medal by finding an additional three nerves hidden throughout the stage. This all sounds fine, but there is a number of things holding this game back, starting with the scaring. Each nerve is a different color. There's a meter on the left of your screen representing the amount of ooze you have. Ooze is used to scare kids. When you collect enough ooze and reach a certain color, you can then scare nerves of that color. I feel like the game was going for a really simple version of Ape Escape here, since the idea is if you search around the levels to scare all these kids, sometimes they'll run away or make you platform a bit. But there's no real challenge to actually catching or scaring the nerves. You tap circle when you're near them, and then they give you this really simple mini game where you got a button bash until the meter is full. You press the X button to initiate a scare animation, and there you go, you did it. This button bashing mini game gets longer depending on the color of the nerve, blue being the easiest one with one section to complete, while red being the hardest with five button bashing sections. There was never a point during this mini game where I thought, this is fun, I'm having a fun time right now. This is a great mechanic that definitely won't wear thin within the first five minutes of the game, but then you do it over and over and over and over until your thumb is in bits and it gets pretty sore. Also, you can watch whatever these awful scare animations are. Oh my god, Sully, what did they do to you, pal? Yeah, so you may have noticed this game is pretty ugly. The characters look super weird and some of the levels have awful texture warping, pop-in and draw distance issues. There's times where the game looks bland the best and an absolute mess at worst. The levels are also super tiny. Your first run of a level usually takes about five minutes. And I say first run because in each level there are items that will only unlock after you've got the bronze medal for each stage in a world. So there's no point really exploring the levels properly until you have these items since they gate off areas with nerves and monster tokens to get extra medals. And even when you do come back, the new areas are also super bland and short. As mentioned, you have the option of playing as Sully or Mike. There's little difference to who you choose outside of their attacks. Sully's attacks register way more often than Mike's. I felt Mike's roll attack especially didn't work half the time. In spite of this though, Mike can do this. So I mean, would you rather a functioning attack or the ability to do this all day? There are enemies, but they are super easy to ignore and don't drop items or count towards level progression in any way. And as mentioned, you might hurt yourself just trying to attack them, so it's best to probably leave them. Control overall is kind of, uh... Like, it's fine on the ground, but as soon as you have to do any sort of mildly precise platforming, the massive jump heights or wonky camera angles will surely mess it up at least once. I don't know, I feel like I'm being kind of harsh on this one. For the most part, it's a pretty functional platformer. The music here is actually really good. If I'm being honest, definitely the best part of the game overall. And there's a ton of good quality video clips here too. But like, who really cares about this sort of thing nowadays? What was a selling point in 2001 means very little now. Overall, even with the replayable sections, the 12 stages on offer here are tiny compared to what we're used to, and it's just, it's just so boring. There isn't any proper boss fights after getting the bronze medal in all levels in the world, you get to race Randall in a stage. These are fine, I guess, collect a certain number of coins, beat Randall to the finish line, and hey, you did it. Also, I'm pretty sure I might have killed Randall at one point, so I hope he's, I hope he's doing alright. Is this the worst game ever? No. Is this the worst game on the list? Absolutely not. But is this an ugly, mediocre 3D platformer devoid of any challenge and lacking most of the charm of the source material? Yeah, sure, why not?
Okay, we're down to the final 10 games and we're starting off with a bang. It's Kid Station. It's um It's a Winnie the Pooh baby game entirely in Japanese. Let's go. It was released in November 2001 and developed by Atlas. Yeah. Atlas. So a bit of backstory, Kid Station was a Japanese range of PS1 games aimed at very young children. And when I say very young, I mean legitimately babies and toddlers. These were primarily educational games featuring tons of famous kids characters from both Japanese and Western media, and they oftentimes came packaged with this special Kid Station controller. Yes, this big yoke with giant buttons, or sometimes even their own game-specific controllers as well. In the case of our Winnie the Pooh game here, the game was packaged with a Pooh Bear controller, which is kinda cute. The controller seems to have a mic add-on as well, but we'll be playing as if we were using the standard 4 button layout. Just X, Circle, Square and Triangle. No matter what you're doing in this game, you will just need these 4 buttons. That's for menu navigation, and controlling your characters, whatever it is, these 4 buttons will sort you out. Obviously being aimed at a younger audience, the goal here is really just to keep it simple for the kids who will be playing it. So this particular game is a Winnie the Pooh number game. I'll be honest, I don't have a whole lot to say about this game as it is entirely in Japanese and made for somebody around 25 years younger than me, but I will highlight some things that I did like. The presentation is actually really nice in this one. Obviously there's not a lot going on on the screen, but the character sprites, the animations, the background, the music, the voices, Yes, they're all in Japanese, but everything that is here is pretty great. The overall presentation is just really good across the board. The mini games that are here are super basic as you'd expect, but there is a good few available and multiple difficulty levels for each, so there is a lot to keep kids engaged here. Also, when you beat a game, you earn some sad Eeyore money. I don't know why this was so funny to me, I never did find out what you could actually spend it on, but like, sad Eeyore money, come on, this is great. I also found this weird set of FMV clips with kids singing songs in Japanese. <laughs> They were pretty... pretty weird. I can't believe I'm at the point in my life where I'm sitting through these in my spare time, but here we are. 2020, baby. Anything is possible. To be honest, I can't really fault this game. It just seems like a really cute game for children, and if I could understand Japanese, I would probably have a lot more to say. But sure, it looks nice at least, and we found out about those cool kid station controllers, which was fun. So yeah, fun game for three-year-old Japanese kids. Not really much more than a curiosity for anybody else. わはい。1。ここ。ここ。ここかな。わはい。Oh no, there's gonna be lots of these, isn't there? Game number 27 is Kid Station. Released the same day as the Winnie the Pooh Kid Station game in November 2001, and once again developed by Atlas and released exclusively in Japan. Yeah, so this is pretty much the same game as the last one, except it's now Mickey Mouse and Friends instead of Winnie the Pooh and Friends. And instead of a Pooh Bear controller, we get a novelty Mickey Mouse controller this time around. I guess it's actually unfair to say it's the same game as the last one. The presentation, graphics and sound maintain the same high level of quality as the previous games, but the selection of games on offer here feel a bit more gamey. While the Winnie the Pooh game was themed around numbers, there does seem to be some more traditional mini games here with some platforming involved. The 4 button layout is far from ideal for actual platforming, but it is super basic here so it does work I guess. There's a game where you build a road for Mickey so you can watch him drive down the route. I'll be honest, I thought he was going to use the jump to go over the wall, but he was just content smashing right into it, so good for him, I guess. There's also a game where you try to tell the time. You go searching for a treasure under the sea, the kids return again for some more singing and dancing. Yeah, it's another baby game entirely in Japanese. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. The mini games do seem more varied in this one, but I guess it really just comes down to where do you prefer Winnie the Pooh or Mickey Mouse more. Otherwise, another cute game for very young Japanese audiences. Not much more to say than that. Thank you. 
Well, 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 look who's back. If it isn't another Winnie the Pooh game. At least this time, it's not a Kid Station title, I suppose. So today we're playing Pooh's Party Game in Search of the Treasure, released in November 2001 and developed by Doki Donkey Studio, the same team responsible for Tigger's Honey Hunt from, I don't know, 16 games ago? Who's even counting anymore? This game was also known as Party Time at Winnie the Pooh and Pal Regions. Why the name change? I don't know, games are just like that sometimes. So from the outset, this probably seems like a Winnie the Pooh take on the Mario Party formula. There's a board, you move across, and there's a bunch of minigames. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. I can sum up all of this game's problem by taking you through the adventure mode. So there is a very loose story holding the game together, but long story short, Winnie and his pals come into possession of a treasure map, and after some hijinks, you're now chasing after it by completing minigames or something. So there isn't really a board game here. It's more like a linear path that you follow space by space. How far you move isn't determined by a dice roll. It's determined by how well you place in minigames, but you can also collect honeypots both on the board and in-game. These honeypots can be cashed in before you move each turn to increase the amount of spaces you can move. Each space costs 10 honeypots and you can move up to a maximum of 3 additional spaces each turn using honeypots. The board itself is super basic, there's spaces that will give you honeypots, spaces that'll take them away, shortcuts, teleport, and spaces that supposedly add extra effects into minigames, but to be honest, I can never really notice them. Also, it's just you on the board, there's no collecting stars, no real goal outside of just moving across the board as quickly as possible. On the first board, you're chasing after your treasure map, on the second board, you're trying to outpace a heffalump, and on the third board, you're trying to outrun a ghost or something. Honestly, it just kind of feels tacked on here. I, I found it super boring, and the positive and negative spaces had very little factor into the gameplay overall. The real meat of this game is the minigames, and this is where the game quickly loses its steam. If you were expecting the variety of a Mario Party game, you'll be sorely mistaken. This game has a grand total of five minigames. Yes, only five. The minigames on offer here are kind of similar to Crash Bash, in the way that the core number of minigames is quite limited, but they do freshen things up by adding different stages for each minigame, and while Crash Bash isn't a perfect game by any means, there is a decent chunk of variety to what's there. In this game, the minigame barely changed from level to level. If you played the Pumpkin minigame once, you've seen it all. If you've played the Bomberman Club once, you've seen it all. The Pong minigame, you thought it was good with one bumper in the middle, well now how about four? The fruit collecting minigame, well this time they've added a bridge to the level, very exciting. Also the only minigame I kind of enjoyed playing was the little racing game that was available, but in my entire time playing the adventure mode, which was about an hour, I only got to play the racing game once. It was just the four other boring minigames over and over and over and over. I was tired of them after 10 minutes, let alone the whole hour of playing them back to back. Like, I'm sure this is more fun in multiplayer, obviously, but overall, the game is just so light on content, and the content that is here, while perfectly functional, is just so derivative and dull. I imagine the studio just reused assets from Tigger's Honey Hunt, and while everything still looks nice, the presentation is severely lacking compared to what we saw in Tigger's Honey Hunt. All the minigames and boards just look so bland. This is clearly just a derivative attempt to cash in on the popularity of games like Mario Party with a popular Disney mascot. And while many games have attempted to do the same, the effort here is one of the dullest I've ever played. If you're a fan of the genre, I would steer well clear of this one. Well, we're back. It's baby time at Winnie the Pooh once again. Although at the very least, this time we do have a game in English, so that's something I suppose. Winnie the Pooh Preschool was first released in Japan in December 2001 under the Kid Station banner and developed by Disney Interactive. But interestingly enough, this game is actually a port of an older PC game that was released in English originally. So in Japan, this game came bundled with a PlayStation mouse and mouse pad rather than the traditional Kid Station controller. And I guess since the PC original was already in English, they might as well release it in North America as well. 
uh, we will be playing the North American release, which came out a little later in November of 2002. It does support the PlayStation mouse, but to my knowledge, there was no mouse bundle ever sold in the West. So now that we can understand what we're doing, is there any fun to be had in a game aimed for two to four year olds? No, not really. Once again, this is a collection of Winnie the Pooh themed games and activities primarily focused on helping develop younger kids skills. Since this is a port of a PC game, the entire thing will feel familiar if you've ever played one of those kids activity centers when you were younger. Everything is controlled using the mouse and the gameplay pretty much just boils down to clicking and dragging and dropping. Very, very simple. Drag and drop the missing link, drag and drop the matching photograph. If you like to drag and drop, this is the game for you. There is also a pretty fun art game included that allows you to colour in some pictures. It can feel a bit wonky at times, but it helps teach you how to mix colours and is probably the most substantial thing in the game. Once again, there is a very limited amount of content in this game. You've got different difficulty levels for each game, but at the end of the day, it is an activity centre for babies. It'll keep them happy, but there is really nothing here for anybody else. What I will say though is that as a PC port, this is actually really impressive. Comparing this to the Mulan and A Bug's Life PC ports we played previously, the quality of the animations and backgrounds here are much, much better. Everything is really smooth and there doesn't seem to be much of a downgrade at all coming from the PC to the PS1. Controlling the mouse pointer with an analog stick also felt pretty good. There's nothing here young kids would struggle with and the presentation is great all round. Honestly, these are the hardest games to talk about because they literally are not made for me or you. They are made for such a specific audience. And honestly, I can barely remember being four years old, but I love Winnie the Pooh. I loved video games. I was probably busy playing Sonic the Hedgehog when I was four, but I would have played the hell out of this Winnie the Pooh game too. For what it's worth, the port is good. The presentation is nice. Hell, I can even understand the mini games this time. And I think I even like them a little bit better than the previous baby games we played. This is really only down to them letting me paint a sleepy Winnie on a chair. So 10 out of 10 for that, I guess. Good at this and quite quickly too. Yellow. Pink. Light blue. Light blue, blue, blue. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, when will this nightmare ever end? <sighs> game number 30 is Winnie the Pooh Kindergarten, the same as the last game, but now it's for slightly older babies. Once again, this is a port of an older PC game developed by Disney Interactive, released in Japan under the Kid Station series in February 2002, once again with a PlayStation mouse and mousepad, and was released in North America in November 2002, alongside our last game, Disney Preschool. Oddly enough, this particular game did get released in PAL territories, but it's retitled as Disney's Learning with Winnie the Pooh. It's also one of the most expensive PAL PS1 games, so that's pretty weird, I guess. Imagine explaining to your wife that you need to spend 300 quid on a Winnie the Pooh game made for babies so you could complete your PAL PS1 collection. Look, I love collecting games as much as the next person, but let's be fair, it can absolutely be a money racket at times. Yeah, so everything I said about the previous game applies here. It's the same interface and presentation, just with new backgrounds and activities to play. I will say the activities here do seem a bit more advanced than in the previous game, but they're still incredibly basic. There's a game where you practice directions on a compass, some number-based games, a game where you sort colors and shapes. Two of the more interesting activities in this game allow you to create your own TOEFL spot using a bunch of different objects and backgrounds. And there's also a pretty basic music suite that allows you to combine different instruments and record your own songs. It's very simple, but I could see kids having a fun time with what's on offer here. Once again, it is another competent game for young kids. Just please don't spend 300 quid on this, please. Map has a few more compass directions. Go southwest to the tree. Southwest. 
go east to the flower patch. Tigerifical go north to the egg. Well, 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 would you look at that. Not a baby game in sight. All I can see is a game aimed at a marginally older audience being played by an adult in his late 20s. We're into the home stretch now. Game number 31 is Peter Pan Return to Neverland, released in February 2002 and developed by the returning Doki Denki Studio. This game was released alongside the straight-to-video sequel of the same name, and it's kind of a weird game. I guess it's a 2.5D action platformer, but the main gimmick in this game is that Peter flies everywhere rather than running and jumping. It makes sense for the character, and while Peter can walk on the ground wherever there is wooden panels to stand on, you move so slow on the ground there's literally no reason to ever do so over flying, so expect this to be your main way of getting around throughout the game. Since you fly everywhere, the levels have a lot of verticality to the design. Since you're not platforming in the traditional sense, the challenge in this game mostly comes from traversing the maps and avoiding the stage hazards and enemies within. The game tries to place an emphasis on exploring with hidden areas and collectibles dotted around the map, and while the levels follow a pretty linear path for the most part, there is some backtracking through levels as you unlock new abilities as the game progresses. Peter gets a basic sword attack early in the game, but as you beat bosses, you gain access to a projectile and magic attack that are used to solve simple puzzles that allow you to access new paths within old levels that help you progress in the game. Levels also often contain secret areas that house film reels that unlock movie clips, permanent health upgrades, and these common feather collectibles, which are used to purchase items in a shop accessible from the level select screen. There's even a map feature which allows you to track which parts of the level you've explored so far. The way I'm describing this game almost makes it seem like a Disney version of something like a Metroidvania or Mega Man X with alternative pathways and secret areas that require backtracking with new abilities to unlock as the game goes on. And I really wish that was the case, but the game is in actual fact deceptively simple and has a couple of other problems which set it back. The levels can seem pretty open at first, but in reality they are all pretty small and simple in design. As mentioned, there is a map function, but I never once needed it while playing. The paths are usually straightforward, and if there's ever a branching path ahead of you, one path likely has a switch or an enemy with a key, and the other path is the one with the door needing said switch or key. The levels follow the same structure. Throughout the game, there's really not that much to them, and even though some of the levels can throw in some new gimmicks, like wind that affects your movement, or a swarm of mosquitoes that chase you throughout the level, the game just starts feeling repetitive and dull way too early into the experience. On top of this, controlling Peter in this game just feels a bit off. Like, you really want Peter to have this snappy, smooth flight control, kind of like how Ariel felt to control underwater in The Little Mermaid, but just in the sky instead. But Peter kind of feels sluggish and heavy. Peter's movement has a bit of momentum to it. He starts out slow and picks up speed as he begins to fly, but even at max speed, he just feels too slow to react to your inputs. When you're just moving through a level collecting feathers and whatnot, it's fine, but when you throw enemies and level hazards into the mix, you start to become aware of how unresponsive everything feels. Combat is also kinda janky, enemy patterns are easy to get down, but fighting usually boils down to just being overly simple or frustrating when you're trying to fight the enemies with the sluggish movement and bad weapon hitboxes. Another weird thing about this game is that your health and magic don't refill after each level either. You collect health and magic pickups from flowers dotted around the levels, but some levels have very few of these. It's never really an issue though, there's no life system here, so if you do die, you just respawn with tree lives and tree magic at the beginning of the stage. But you can also use your feathers in the shop to refill your magic or health. I never did this though because there was a secret mystery chest that cost a ton of feathers that I was determined to save up for. I did that by the way, and it was just a, a dumb health upgrade, so that was a letdown, I guess. One other nitpick that probably bothered me more than it should have was that for a game that tries to put an emphasis on exploration, the game sure does like to tell you how to do everything. If you need to backtrack to an old level and use an ability to take an alternative path, the game will just drop you directly on the level you need to enter and tell you where to go and what to do. It takes any sort of mystery out of it. This happens with the enemies and bosses too. Before you first fight an enemy or a new boss, the game will just be like, hey, here's what you need to dodge. Also, here's when you need to attack. Okay, enjoy, have a nice time, good luck. 
I just don't get it. Like, I know it's a kid's game, but there's no fun in just being told the solutions over the satisfaction of solving things yourself. Also, I almost forgot, but there are sections where you play as Tinkerbell. You know those games where you hold a button to go up and you release a button to drop down and you need to balance your button presses while the character moves to the right automatically? Yeah, it's just that, but with no challenge and the levels last about 40 to 60 seconds. I don't know, this game, it's disappointing because I feel like the bones of a fun game are present here. I mean, it has its positives. The graphics are clean and colorful. The characters and animations look pretty good. There's a bunch of story scenes. The locales used for levels while repeated often do look nice as well. The boss fights, while pretty short, were enjoyable. And the music is actually really, really good in this game. You'll find a lot of tracks repeating from level to level, but it's catchy, the quality is high, and it invokes a lot of familiar tunes from the movie, so it hit all the right notes for me. With that being said, there are too many flaws in the core gameplay and level design that just detract from the fun that's here. Even with the prospect of getting a boost to my movement speed, I just wasn't vibing with this enough to want to keep going. It's an okay game, but unless you're a big Peter Pan fan, I wouldn't really bother with this one. So have you ever wanted to move into a new house and find that Mickey and Minnie Mouse are your next door neighbours? And also watch as they invite themselves over to eat all your food and leave it out cleaning up? Well let me tell you, I've got the game for you. My Disney Kitchen is another port of an older PC game developed by Disney Interactive. It's hard to narrow down when this game was officially released, but the internet tells me it was anywhere from June 2002 up until December 2002, but most sites say it was sometime in summer 2002. This once again was also released in Japan under the Kid Station line, bundled once again with a mouse and mouse pad. This is still another education slash activity game, although as the name implies, this game more or less allows you to play around in a kitchen and just do whatever you want. You can see what's in the fridge, fry it up, burn it, sky's the limit. There's a surprising amount of tools this game gives you, and for the most part it's up to you to play around and see what works with what, and try to cook whatever dish comes to mind. The entire game takes place inside this kitchen area, and you're pretty much free to set it up as you like. Don't like the tablecloth? Get a new one. Is that wallpaper not tacky enough? Make it tackier. Want to cook up your favourite meal of a pizza, popcorn, and a hamburger with ketchup on top of the bun for some reason? Sure, go for it. It is actually kind of fun to experiment with everything that's on offer here, but outside of messing about with a combination of different foods and cooking methods, there's not really a whole lot else to this game. There are some extra parts of the kitchen, like this breakfast grill or the cake station, which allow you to create a few extra things, but it's pretty much more of the same. Mickey and Minnie pop in from time to time to drop hints, eat your food, or compliment your new wallpaper, but once the novelty of trying different foods with different appliances wears off, there's not much more to this game. I do like that the game included a bunch of real recipes for you to cook at home, with parental supervision of course, but I feel like this feature makes more sense on the PC when you had the functionality to actually print the recipes. I couldn't imagine somebody following a recipe from the TV in their kid's bedroom, like... While the game does seem to have ported over well from the PC, I will say the mouse cursor in this game is noticeably slower compared to the last few PC ports I played, and made navigating around the kitchen feel like a bit of a chore at times if I'm being honest. I think as a game for young people interested in cooking, there is actually a lot to like here. Still, regardless, the game is pretty light on content overall, and does feel better suited for a mouse rather than the standard PlayStation controller. Regardless, it's probably the Kid Station game I had the most fun playing, at least for the first 20 minutes or so. I mean, it's still a baby game, but I don't know, kitchen simulators are kind of fun, I guess? Maybe I just have a thing for making virtual popcorn, who knows.
Next up we have Lilo and Stitch released for the PlayStation in June 2002 and developed by Blitz Games, the same studio behind The Little Mermaid 2. What we have here is another Crash Bandicoot clone, linear 3D levels, side-scrolling platform levels and levels where you're being chased towards the screen. As mentioned before, I genuinely really like these kinds of games when done well, but Lilo and Stitch is definitely one of the more forgettable and frustrating instances I have played in this style. In this game you alternate between both Lilo and Stitch when playing, each character controls pretty similarly but there are a few differences when playing as either Lilo or Stitch. Lilo is the most basic character, she has a basic jump, a close range voodoo attack, an aerial drop attack and the ability to pick up and drop certain objects. Lilo can also collect a special attack which instantly kills an enemy in your path. Stitch on the other hand has access to a spit attack and a spin attack in case you didn't want this game to remind you of Crash Manicoot more. Also a drop attack and invincible roll attack that can be charged by collecting soft drink collectibles throughout the stage. Levels have a number of collectibles but your main goal in each stage is to collect 4 progression items per stage. These items can change from level to level but you do need them to progress as the game goes on, kind of like Crash Bandicoot's crystals but just more of them per level. The game unfortunately is just not that fun to play, the levels often look and feel very similar with long open stretches with nothing to do and the platforming sections and enemies are often really frustrating to play thanks to some really bad controls and hit detection. Both Lilo and Stitch feel somehow both too too sensitive and at the same time really unresponsive to control and as soon as you try to do any platforming it becomes apparent how difficult it is to make precise movements and jumps. Even the most simple platforms in this game can cause you real hassle. Also your jump and most of your attacks have a really awkward delay. You can't jump while attacking so oftentimes you will try to attack an enemy and then quickly input a jump to get over a platform but find yourself just walking straight into a pit. Jumping again after landing also doesn't seem to work at all sometimes, uh, attacking enemies is also kind of a shit show. Oftentimes your attacks just don't connect and you can't jump on the enemies or do normal mid-air attacks to hurt them, your only option is your drop attack, which is also angled slightly weird rather than just going straight down so it's pretty awkward to use and it also doesn't register a lot of the time too. These control issues also transfer over to the side scrolling and chase levels which will cause you just as much hassle there as well. The game also for whatever reason gets you to fight the same mini boss over and over and over again after each level. It's just some like rock golem. I don't know why he's blocking my way but he appears all the time and his pattern never changes. It's such a dumb boring fight but they make you do it so many times and his health gets bigger every time. I, I don't know what they were thinking with this one. Presentation also isn't that great, as mentioned the levels all feel pretty similar, they definitely could have done a lot more with a Hawaiian island as its setting. The visuals are also pretty choppy, the animations and cutscenes look pretty bad too. I guess Stitch here looks pretty cute, but overall this is a pretty ugly game, especially for 2002. This game also has some of the worst sound mixing I've heard so far. The music is generally fine with some nice tropical and Hawaiian inspired tracks, but the mixing can just make the music sound pretty grating at times overall, either way too loud or just a bit too low. Lilo and Stitch would have been a mediocre enough game if it at least had good controls, but with how unresponsive and frustrating everything feels, this unfortunately just feels like a bad rush job. After I thought Blitz Games did a pretty good job with The Little Mermaid 2, it's disappointing to see their lazy attempt here with Lilo and Stitch. Stick with Donald Duck if you want a good Disney replacement for Crash. Lilo and Stitch ain't as bad as The Lion King, but the game's still an awful Crash clone and not worth your time at all. Only two games left now and we are down to our last game from the year 2002. Disney's Treasure Planet released in November of 2002 and developed by Magenta Software. Treasure Planet is a 3D action platformer based on the movie of the same name. 
In this game, you'll be playing as young Jim Hawkins. Jim has access to a standard set of moves and abilities. You can double jump, glide across the stage with a hang glider. You've got access to a sword for close range melee, which can be used on the ground or in the air for a drop attack. You also have access to a pistol for ranged attacks, and this can also be shot from a first person view if you collect a temporary pistol power up. The first thing that I noticed when playing this game is that Jim feels kind of stiff to control to say the least. I was worried pretty early on that this was going to be another game just bogged down by frustrating controls from the get-go, but as I began to play through the first level, the level design was actually geared towards the character movement pretty well. It was still pretty sluggish, but when traversing the stage and platforming, I never really felt that the stiff controls affected my enjoyment too much. The levels in this game are also surprisingly long, with most of the platforming stages taking around 30 to 40 minutes to beat. There's enough variety and changes in the scenery to keep things fun throughout each stage. Usually each level is broken up into two main sections with plenty of collectibles and enemies along the way. The enemies don't really have that much variety to them, there's usually one of three different types, an enemy with a ranged attack that can only be hurt by your sword, the big enemies that can only be hurt by your pistol, and then the small enemies that tend to charge you upon sight. These can be killed with either your sword or pistol. Your main goal though throughout the game is to collect treasure pieces which are needed to access levels throughout the game. These can be completed by completing mini games for characters within each stage. These mini games are usually pretty fun and even though they are sometimes repeated from stage to stage, there's usually a new feature or gimmick added to keep it fresh each time. They can also be found behind secret walls, which with how they are marked aren't really that secret to be honest. You can also get extra pieces by collecting all the treasure maps in a stage as well. The most common collectible is money and gems, which is needed in some areas to pay to progress, but they're pretty common to find the levels, so they never really halted my progression in any way. The gameplay loop here honestly isn't too bad, as mentioned the controls here aren't the best for this kind of game, but it's a pretty competent action platformer and I didn't really find myself getting bored while playing through the game. While platforming takes up a big chunk of the game, there's also a number of racing stages you'll play as well. The controls for this are a little bit sensitive and take some time to get used to, but each stage requires you to complete six laps of the track while trying to collect items and clocks to increase your time limit. So after completing one or two laps of a track, it becomes pretty easy to get the hang of everything. The racing levels usually have alternate paths and environmental changes for each lap that can make the race more difficult as it goes on, but honestly these are pretty easy and you shouldn't have too much trouble trying to get the treasure pieces for beating set times on each lap. I will say the jumps for some ramps can feel a bit delayed and cost you some cheap deaths, but this wasn't frequent enough to really become too bothersome. The boss fights here were also pretty fun as well, they all had multiple phases, new mechanics added just for the fights, they weren't terribly difficult, but they were some of the better boss fights that I've had on this list. Unfortunately though, this game is pretty light on content overall. The entire game only comprises four areas with four platforming levels, four races and two boss fights in total. Yeah, the platforming levels can be pretty long, but the bosses and races only last a few minutes each. So there's really not a whole lot to this game and while I enjoyed my time playing it, it did start getting pretty repetitive by the end. Treasure Planet is also a very, uh, ugly game. There's texture warping everywhere, the animations can look pretty janky, the character models are weird, and the levels overall, I mean, I think there's some areas that aren't even textured properly, if I'm being honest. This would look pretty bad for an early PS1 game, but in late 2002, this is especially poor, to be honest. There's also some annoying quirks with the game. This platformer has fall damage for some reason, and trying to get down from platforms to avoid fall damage can actually feel pretty awkward at times. There's also this really weird inconsistency with ledge grabbing. Some ledges you can grab onto just fine, other ledges that look exactly the same, you just can't. There's not that many instances where you need to grab ledges, but there are oftentimes parts where I'd have to start a platforming section all over again, just because I tried to grab a ledge that I wasn't meant to grab. The audio mixing in this game is also kind of weird. Voices can overlap on top of one another and awkwardly pause the music while they are playing. Crates are vulnerable to any form of attack you inflict upon them, be it from the importance of your laser or your sword. The background music also cuts off before looping in each level. That being said, probably my favourite thing about this game is the soundtrack. The music for each level is really fucking good and the quality is pretty high too. It mixes fantasy with a lot of diddly idol style Irish music, which obviously I'm a big fan of. There's not a huge selection of music in the game overall, but what's here is some of the best I've heard on the list. I actually 
actually thought this game was kind of fun. It's an average game at best, ugly as sin, really short and kind of janky to play at times, but it is somewhat competent. The levels are fun to explore, the bosses were good, the races are kind of fun, and the music is great. I can understand this game being absolutely panned upon release in 2002 because it plays like an early 3D platformer from like 1997 or something, but there's an alright game here overall. It actually holds up better than a lot on this list if I'm being honest. Not exactly a hidden gem or anything, but probably a little bit better than anybody gives it credit for. Well, here we are, the last Disney game ever released on the PS1. 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Avenger was released in October 2003, only in North America and developed by Digital Eclipse. I really enjoyed 102 Dalmatians on the PS1, so we couldn't possibly be blessed with another good Dalmatians game on the system, could we? Okay, so, a few things. Immediately I noticed the music in this game was the same music used in 102 Dalmatians, only much worse in quality and in 30 second loops. Hello. I also noticed some of the art and models were taken from 102 Dalmatians as well. What is happening here? Both this game and 102 Dalmatians were published by Eidos, and it seems like what this game is, is a quickly thrown together cash grab using the assets and music from 102 Dalmatians. That's kind of really weird to see on the PlayStation 1. I don't know if that's weird for anybody else, but that's like... I don't think I've seen that before. That's pretty strange. Honestly, this game though, it's... It's so fucking bad. The whole game is like a top-down collect-a-thon maze game where you just roam around the level collecting a certain quota of items or just trying to find the exit. Every single level in this game is more or less the exact same thing and the gameplay is just so simple it could be an NES game. You've a jump that has no height, a bark attack that stuns enemies and a roll attack that breaks boxes but to be honest since there's no cooldown on the roll I just use this over and over to help me move through the levels as quickly as possible. You get knocked back when hit by enemies and the enemies just like to charge at you out of nowhere. Plus there's no invincibility frames so the enemies can take away nearly all your health in an instant. There's a bunch of extra collectibles and levels as well but they don't seem to do or unlock anything. From what I can tell there's literally no additional content in this game, no way to check what items you've collected for which level. Hell, I think this is the only movie tie-in game that doesn't even have clips from the movie, it's just still images with text. Sure look, even the menu looks like it was whipped up in a few minutes. This game is the definition of a cash grab, a super late release into the PS1's life cycle and just one of the most boring and repetitive games imaginable. Made using assets from a vastly superior game, the controls are bad, the top down angle is awkward, the enemies are bad, you can play 10 levels in a row and every single one will look the exact same and have you exploring barren, open areas just begging for something interesting to happen. The music is alright at least, seeing as it's just ripped straight from 102 Dalmatians, but even here the music sounds worse and is looped really badly. It's just one of the most blatantly lazy games I've ever played and it really shows you the kind of quality games we were getting towards the end of the PlayStation's life cycle. Just complete and utter trash. <laughs> Well, there you go, there's a review of every single Disney PS1 game released. Can't believe you managed to cover all of them. Or did we? Yeah, so while searching for images online, long after I had shot all the footage, 
done most of the editing, done all the voice recording, I managed to find another one. You're joking. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly, I can't stand this. Yes, another one. So the game we missed is called Learning with Mickey. It's another PAL exclusive port of a PC educational game. I'm just gonna show you some quick footage just so we can make sure we've covered everything. And somebody in the comments would have told me anyway, so fuck it, <laughs> why not? Yeah, so this game is called Disney's Learning Mickey and it was released at some point in 2002 exclusively for PAL regions. Bit of a weird name if you're where I'm from, but sure, look, we're all with it. So this is another port of an older PC educational game called Get Ready for School with Mickey. Once again, we have another weird name change, but sure, look, that's just how it is. Nothing new or unique here outside of the setting. Mickey is a journalist and you roam a city at night. I think the music and voice acting is the best I've seen in any of these games. The game features a lot of smooth jazz as well, which is actually a really nice mix with the nighttime setting. The game's activities, however, are kind of bland and the game just doesn't run that smoothly at all. I figured it could just be the emulator, but I checked online for gameplay and it was the same there, unfortunately. This mix with an excessive amount of low times means this seems to be the worst performing PC port of them all, which is a shame to be honest. So nothing really special here, just another educational game, but probably the worst of the bunch. Okay, so now we think I've covered them all. I hope. Fuck, I better missed another one. But for now, we are ready to move on to the final section of the video where I will rank every single Disney game from worst to best. But first, I'm gonna cheat just a little bit. So here's the thing, all the educational games, all the baby games, all the learning center games, the PC ports, and the games that were exclusive to the Japanese market that were built ground up for the PS1. The issue is that trying to even get them together and compare them against them seems a bit unfair. I mean, realistically, with the amount of gameplay that's in them, they would all be near the bottom of the list, but they, they weren't really made for that purpose. They were made to like just be kind of like an educational tool or like a fun activity center game to play. Not really a traditional gaming experience. So I feel ranking them alongside the other games it's kind of a moot point at this stage, it doesn't really seem like something it's worth doing. Although for people who like lists, I did manage to rank the games from best to worst just so they're covered somewhere. I mean, these are only really based on how much I enjoyed playing them for the brief amount of time that I did, but I mean, if you're gonna try one of them, at least try the one that lets you cook a cake, I suppose. That was a bit of fun. That was a good time for everybody, I think me specifically but Sherlock. So with those out of the way that leaves us with 28 games remaining so here is every Disney PS1 game ranked from worst to best. Ugh, just, just roll the damn video. Coming in dead last and deservedly so, we've got one of the very worst games on the PlayStation and one of the worst that I've ever played, period. It's 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure taking the number 28 spot and the title as the worst Disney game on the PS1. Coming up next and honestly not that far off being the worst Disney game on the console, Dinosaur is a janky, slow, unfun game that tries to be something a little different but fails in every conceivable way and earns its spot at number 27. The worst Crash Bandicoot clone I've ever played, Lion King Simba's Mighty Adventure, is a frustrating mess that takes its place at number 26. The second worst Crash Bandicoot clone I've ever played, Lilo and Stitch's awful player movement and combat combined with its bland repetitive level design, see it come in at number 25. Aladdin may want to show you the world, but you'll want to show this game the bin. Aladdin in the series Revenge is number 24. Winnie the Pooh's charm can't save this party game from bad mini games, a lack of content, and an awful single player experience. Pooh's party game in search of the treasure is number 23. Monsters Inc. is one of the most basic and ugly attempts at a 3D platformer I've ever seen on the PlayStation. 
Screen Team button bashes its way to number 22. Traveler's Tales drops the ball with a weird take on the action genre that just misses the mark in so many ways. Buzz Lightyear of Star Command is falling with style into number 21. Lousy controls, awkward combat and overly simple gameplay let down what could have been an interesting direction for a Disney game. Peter Pan Return to Neverland takes the number 20 slot. A really strange short game that runs and controls like shit, but Goofy fans and young kids might get a kick out of it. Goofy's Funhouse comes in at number 19. An interesting setting doesn't make up for the poor graphics, overly sensitive controls and woeful character selection in Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour, crashing straight into a wall at number 18. While there is some fun to be had here, the overly repetitive, bland and maze-like levels make this game feel like a chore before long. The Emperor's New Groove comes in at number 17. While the character roster is good, the driving feels great and there's a decent chunk of content, the repetitive nature of the progression system with its unfun forced arena battles hold back what could have been a great kart racer. Toy Story Racer is number 16. It's a pretty game that's fun for kids, but one that most people will get bored of pretty quickly thanks to some overly simple gameplay and level design. Tigger's Honey Hunt is number 15. The worst rhythm game on our list, but still a pretty good time all round. Tight gameplay with a small but good selection of music available and a cameo from Lou Bega sees the Jungle Book Rhythm and Groove swing its way into number 14. A difficult but rewarding rhythm game with a weird selection of Japanese Mickey Mouse tracks that's probably only worth trying with the right controller, but poppin' music Mickey Tunes comes in at number 13. The biggest surprise for me on this list, it's short and it's pretty ugly, but the great soundtrack and variety in the gameplay kept me entertained until the very end. Treasure Planet is number 12. It may be very short and very easy, but great swimming movement and some very nice looking underwater levels make this a fun game to sit back and kill an error with. The Little Mermaid 2 comes in at number 11. The first game to break the list of top 10 Disney PS1 games, some awkward controls and cheap difficulty hold the game back, but there's still a lot of fun to be had with Disney's Tarzan taking its place at number 10. It may have the weighty movement and cheap enemies of Tarzan, but the lovely blend of 2D and 3D mixed with more varied levels and a great soundtrack make this a fun action game nonetheless. Hercules takes number 9 on the list. The game may be a Crash Bandicoot clone, but at least it does it well. It's a very short game, but the tight controls and fun gameplay help elevate Donald Duck Quack Attack to the number 8 spot. Fun action-adventure gameplay with multiple playable characters helps set this game apart from others on the list and it's possibly the best looking Disney game on the console. Atlantis The Lost Empire is number 7. The visuals for this game haven't aged too well but with some clever gameplay mechanics and one of the best soundtracks on the PlayStation, A Bug's Life is still good fun even today and takes the number 6 spot. Whether you like this game or not depends on how you feel about DDR, but it's a great version of the popular rhythm series, one of the best and weirdest track lists I've ever seen in a video game. Dance Dance Revolution Disney Mix steps on in to number 5. If you think it's only high in this list because it's Tetris, well that's because you're right, because it is Tetris and Tetris is good. But with some new game types and Capcom adding their fantastic presentation and music to the mix, this is a great version of the classic puzzler and one of the best Disney games on the system. Magical Tetris Challenge is number 4. 102 Dalmatians really surprised me. While the graphics won't impress, the gameplay is tight, the music is great and there is a ton of level variety as well. 102 Dalmatians is a great licensed 3D platformer and earns its spot as the third best Disney game on the PS1. It may be a port of a 16-bit game but some nice enhancements add to what is one of the best tributes to classic Mickey Mouse out there and it's a damn fun 2D platformer as well. 
It's not a long game, but the toy control, tough platforming, and beautiful animation means it holds up way better than most of the 3D games on our list. Mickey's World Adventure takes its place as the second best Disney game on the PS1. And our number one out of 36 Disney games released for the original PlayStation, in my opinion, the best Disney game on the PS1 is Toy Story 2 Buzz Lightyear to the Rescue. On the whole, this is the game that gets the most right. Buzz controls great, the levels have a ton of visual and gameplay variety, and most importantly, from start to finish, it's just a fun, well-made video game. So, so many of these games on the list don't hold up that well after all these years, but Toy Story 2, if you were to pick it up for the first time ever today, I think you will have a really, really good time with this game. A game I thought was great in 1998, and a game I think is great in 2020, Toy Story 2 earns its place as the number one Disney game on the PlayStation 1. So there you have it. Do you agree with my ranking? Leave a comment. Tell me below. Tell me how much you hate, <laughs> how wrong I got everything. That's fine. Bully me. I don't care. So I wouldn't really say any of these games are mandatory for your PS1 collection, but that's not to say that they aren't fun games. A licensed game strength has always been allowing you to play around in the world from your favorite TV shows, movies, books, whatever. And if you're looking to do just that, the PS1 Disney library offers up a lot of fun choices that are fun even today. So with that, we've arrived at the end of the video. Um, if you watch it the whole way through, that's fucking, that's mad. Fair play to you. I don't know if I could do that. I mean, I made it. I had to listen to my voice for about 20 hours plus and that's not nice <laughs> also apologies about the setup i have a shitty apartment with bad lighting and this was the i don't i would ideally not i would ideally not like to hold a mic up to my mouth but this is the only way where i could not have shit audio well you know less shit audio i guess is the best way to put it so look if you enjoyed the video and you liked the idea and you'd like to see more of this type of video let me know in the comments below drop me a like drop me a subscribe every like equals one serotonin and every subscribe equals an additional serotonin so that's two whole serotonin fuck me my body could use some serotonin i know i have a ton that i can improve on trying to do a video of this scale as a first attempt was probably not the best idea i've ever came up with but sure look we've learned a lot from it and we can only get better from here i hope that's how things work right you naturally get better as time goes on yeah yeah that sounds about right i've got plenty of ideas for videos down the line i'm definitely going to work on something a little bit smaller for the next video i'd say but if there's anything you'd like to see please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments and i'll take a look and if something sounds cool if it was possible who knows i might just get to work on it not like I'm doing anything else. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all again. Bye 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 bye